Let us pray. Almighty God, we willingly acknowledge you as a supreme being, most gracious and most merciful. Look down, we beseech you, on us who are members of this Senate, and deign to assist us in the duties that we have to perform on behalf of our beloved country of Trinidad and Tobago. Open our eyes to see the truth and help us to accept it with all its implications into our lives. Direct us, O oh Lord, in our deliberations so that setting aside private interests, unwholesome prejudices, and personal affections, we may treat all matters set before us with honesty, courage, and conviction. Through all we say and do in this Senate, may we give glory and honor to your holy name, inspire confidence in our fellow citizens, and make a positive contribution to the peace and prosperity of our nation. Amen. Announcements by the President. Honorable Senators, I have granted leave of absence to Senator the Honorable Dr. Amy Brown and Senator Damian Lyder, both of whom are out of the country, and to Senator Dirup Timal, who is ill. Honorable Senators, I have received the following correspondence from Her Excellency the President, Paula May Weeks, OR. TT. The Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, by Her Excellency Paula May Weeks, ORTT, President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago and Commander in Chief of the Armed Forces, to Mr. Michael Seals. Whereas Senator the Honorable Dr. Amy Brown is incapable of performing his duties as a senator, by reason of his absence from Trinidad and Tobago. Now, therefore, I, Paula May Weeks, President as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441A and Section 444A of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, acting in accordance with the advice of the Prime Minister, do hereby appoint you, Michael Seals, to be a member of the Senate temporarily with effect from the 25th of January, 2023, and continuing during the absence from Trinidad and Tobago of Senator the Honorable Dr. Amy Brown, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President, St. Anne's, this 24th day of January, 2023. To Mr. Dominic Smith, whereas Senator Damian Lyder is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of his absence from Trinidad and Tobago. Now, therefore, I, Paula May Weeks, President as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441A and Section 444B of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, acting in accordance with the advice of the Leader of the Opposition, do hereby appoint you, Dominic Smith, to be a member of the Senate temporarily with effect from the 25th of January, 2023, and continuing during the absence of Senator Damian Lyder by reason of his absence from Trinidad and Tobago, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President, St. Anne's, this 24th day of January, 2023. To Mr. Josh Drayton, whereas Senator Dirup Timal, is incapable of performing his duties as a senator by reason of illness. Now, therefore, I, Paula May Weeks, President as aforesaid, in exercise of the power vested in me by Section 441B and Section 444C of the Constitution of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, do hereby appoint you, Josh Drayton, to be a member of the Senate temporarily, with effect from the 25th of January, 2023, and continuing during the absence of Senator Dirup Timal by reason of illness, given under my hand and the seal of the President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago at the Office of the President, St. Anne's, this 24th day of January, 2023. Honorable Senators, Senators are required to take the oath.
I, Michael Seals, having been appointed a member of parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the Constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago upon which I am about to enter. I, Dominic Smith, having been appointed a member of Parliament, do swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the Constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, upon which I am about to enter. I, Josh Drayton, having been appointed a member of Parliament to swear by Almighty God that I will bear true faith and allegiance to Trinidad and Tobago, will uphold the Constitution and the law, and will conscientiously and impartially discharge the responsibilities to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, upon which I am about to enter. Honorable Senators, former Senator and Vice President of the Senate, Mr. Royal Titus, passed away on Monday, January 2nd, 2023. I now invite members to offer tributes. Senator Hislop. Uh, Mr. President, it gives me great privilege and honor to stand on behalf of the government bench and join in paying tribute to Royal Winston Axback Titus, a well-known scholar, teacher, musician, choreographer, politician, a true leader, and a fellow Tobagonian. He was a multifaceted man who was born in the village of Lance for me to humble beginnings, but through passion, hard work, and dedication, he rose to be a well-known figure throughout the island and country. Roll was fondly known in the Tobago space as Axback, and his own words would have given a most interesting account as to just how he came by that name. And Mr. President, though humorous, it isn't one I want to repeat in this honorable house. Mr. Titus was a primary school teacher, principal, acting school supervisor, co-founded the Buku Folk Theater, founded the Tobago Folk Performing Company, vice president of the Tobago Calypsonian Association, president of the Tobago Football Association, vice chairman, subsequently chairman of the Tobago Heritage Festival, chairman of the Tobago Carnival Development 
Committee and a six-time Tobago Calypso monarch, as well as 19-time National Calypso Monarch semifinalist, amongst many other accolades. He was a strong advocate for the preservation of Tobago's culture and heritage, and as a true cultural icon, he worked tirelessly to promote the island's culture to raise awareness and to raise the awareness of its importance. He played a key role in the development of several cultural initiatives on the island. He was instrumental in the formation of the Northside Combined Community and has been a driving force behind its success. And in 2000, he led the villages of Lansfomi, Bloody Bay, Palativi, and Castara to the Tobago Heritage Festival and Best Village from 2001 to 2003. He held a passion for all things cultural in Tobago and was particularly proud of our local tambourine band and worked assiduously towards the continued development of the art form. He was a, mas he was a master at his craft. His work was known, loved, and respected by many. He was a true pioneer in the world of Calypso music and his work has had a lasting impact on the genre. He will be remembered as a true legend, as his works continue to inspire and delight audiences for many years to come. Uh, he was a, a stalwart of the Tobago Carnival scene and won many awards for his costumes. He was an active member of the People's National Movement Tobago Council and was always working to promote the party's values. He was a true leader and was always working to help his fellow Tobagonians. He was a strong advocate for education and often spoke out about the importance of education for the people of Tobago. It is not surprising then that throughout his illustrious career, he exhibited as much humility as professional dignity. The People's National Movement Tobago Council recognized his, these sterling qualities and had the privilege of appointing him to the national parliament as a senator during the years 2002 to 2004. He served as vice president, the second highest position in this, in this place. And his brilliance was obvious, his decisions laudable, and his overall demeanor one that earned him the respect of his colleagues. He was a strong leader, a fair and impartial presiding officer, and was well liked by all who knew him. He was a man of integrity and principle, and was indeed a credit to the Senate. His amazing ability, Mr. President, to connect with people and his ability to inspire others made him a great role model to the younger generation and one who made a positive impact on everyone he met. The People's National Movement is proud to have had Mr. Royal Titus as a part of its team and is grateful for the contributions he has made to the party and to the nation of Trinidad and Tobago. Royal transitioned on Monday 2nd, January 2023 but his memory still lives on. Mr. President, we on the government bench salute Royal Winston Axback Titus and a life well lived. Senator Mark. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. President, on behalf of the Opposition United National Congress Senate Bench, we would like to extend to the family, friends, and associates of the late former Senator Royal Titus. A cultural guru has fallen. He now belongs to the ages. Mr. President, I had a distinct pleasure, honor, and opportunity of serving under the distinguished 
former vice president and senator in our parliament, in the Senate. And I can say without any equivocation or ambiguity that Royal Titus was a very decent, dignified, civilized individual. We got from him a fierce sense of independence in whatever he embarked upon. In any parliament, there will be exchanges, there will be clashes. And of course, when you occupy the chair that you are now occupying, Mr. President, you have to do what you have to do. But one can say without a doubt that former Vice President Royal Titus played his role, contributed enormously to our country. And I dare say Royal was literally the repository of rich cultural knowledge and experience. As my colleague from Tobago, Senator Hislop said earlier, he was a writer, but not a publisher. And I hope that the people of Tobago would gather his writings on many aspects of culture in that, isle, that island called Tobago, and by extension, Trinidad and Tobago, so that the young ones who are emerging would learn from his rich experience. In the, in the document I received from the parliament, it talks about a pioneer anthropologist and cultural icon. And I think those words really sums up this illustrious son of the soil. He served on committees in this honorable parliament. He served with distinction as vice president, in spite, as I said, of whatever differences we would have had. And I think Trinidad and Tobago has lost a truly cultural giant and hero. And I really would like on behalf, you know, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, you know, he reminded me of persons who have passed through our chambers. He was in politics, but not a politician. Because when you dealt with him, there was a certain balance that you met when you dealt with him. And he was so fiercely independent, which he guarded that independence. He guarded jealously that in his latter days, he parted ways with the party that he was associated with for all these years. Because of that fierceness of independence and thinking and thought. So Mr. Vice President, on behalf of our bench, we would like to extend to his family once again our sincerest condolences. And may the Almighty God permit him Permit his, permit his soul to be rested in peace or to allow his soul to rest in peace and rise in glory. I thank you, Mr.
President. Senator Dillon Remy. Thank you, Mr. President, for allowing me to pay tribute to Mr. Roel Titus, a former Vice President of the Senate of Trinidad and Tobago, who departed this life on January the 2nd, 2023rd, at the age of 80 years. How can I do justice in this short time to a man who had done so much in so many spheres of influence in Trinidad and Tobago? But I will pick a few areas. At the level of the Trinidad and Tobago Parliament, as was already said, he served as a government senator in the seventh Republican Parliament from April 5th to the 28th of August 2002. In the eighth Republican Parliament, he was vice president of the Senate from October the 16th, October the 17th, 2002 to 28th September 2007. During this period, he performed the functions of President of the Senate in the absence of Honorable Dr. Linda Babulal on many occasions. During his term as Senator, he served on several committees, including the Joint Select Committee of Parliament appointed to consider and report on government ministries, statutory authorities, and state enterprises. He was also on the Statutory Instruments Committee of the Senate. But before he came to serve at the level of the Parliament, I can only describe him as a consummate community man who loved the island of his birth and served his people in several spheres of influence. In the areas of culture, as already mentioned by Senator Hislop, he co-founded the Buku Folk Theater in 1971. He founded the Tobago Folk Performing Company in 1983. He was vice president of the Tobago Calypso Association in, from 1985 to 1996, vice chairman of the Tobago Heritage Festival and chairman of the Tobago Heritage Festival 2001-2002, chairman of the Carnival Development Committee 2002-2003, and already mentioned Calypso Monarch and appeared at the national semifinals on 19 occasions, but never appeared in the national finals. But where did this all start? It started, he was born on this January the 24th, 1942, to parents Benjamin and Gertrude Titus. He was the father of Carol Small, Andre Titus, Anissa Grant, and Randy Titus. Educated at Bishop's High School, then moved to Port of Spain Teachers College where he obtained his teacher's diploma. Pursued further education at Drew University where he obtained a BA in anthropology with a minor in sociology. He also contributed to the formal education system, training young Tobagonians as a primary school teacher for 20 years between 63 and 83 and principal and then acting supervisor, acting school supervisor one. And he was awarded national teacher of the year in 1974-1975. This cultural icon, teacher, Calypsonian arranger, panis, choreographer, was also an author. His anthropological publication, Wake, People Wake, The Sacred and the Profane, explored the funeral rites and traditions of Tobago. I quote an article by Devon Miggins titled, Ground Breaking Georgia, and it states, Royal Axback Titus, is a Mount St. George native who grew up in the village in the 50s. 
He's a multi-talented teacher, Calypsonian musician and sportsman. Noel Hector, who grew up in Georgia at the same time, and by the way, Georgia is the name that Tobagonians call Mount St. George. Roel, he's a multi-talented teacher, Calypsonian musician and sportsman. Noel Hector, who grew up in Georgia in the 60s, recalls looking up to Titus as a youth. He stated, Roel was the only man in the village who had a degree. Hector admired Titus's ability to excel in so many different spheres, yet be such a contributive force in the Georgia community. Mr. Titus continued to be a nurturer and protector of the months in George history, talent, and culture. And as recently as 2009, was one of the driving forces behind a magazine produced by Monks and George Village Council called Monks and George in Focus. The magazine was a collection of the best of the village, theme, best of the village, the theme of which was connecting and identifying. As Secretary of Tourism of the Tobago House of Assembly, Councilor Latasha Burris says, Mr. Titus's commitment to the island's cultural fraternity spanned more than six decades and was certainly revered throughout Tobago. As a result of this, in 2019, he was honored by the Division of, of Tourism for his contributions to the Tobago Heritage Festival in the fields of composition, dance, choreography, and playwright. His name is forever immortalized in the history and is currently mounted among other cultural giants at the Tobago Icons Museum. So yes, he told the story about how he got his name, Axback. When he was a teenager, he refused to participate in a particular activity with some of his male friends. And they told him, you're dull like the back of an ax. And as a result, he was called Axback. Today, on behalf of the independent senators, I wish to offer condolences to his loved ones and his community. Our nation has lost a cultural icon. May his family be comforted by the legacy he has left. Farewell, Sir Titus. Thank you. Honorable Senators, a life of that lived by former Vice President of the Senate, Royal Titus, is not easy to capture in just a few words. Indeed, it is a life worthy of being celebrated. And so I am grateful for the tributes that have been delivered here today, offering reflections on the life of this great son of the soil. As a proud Tobagonian, Royal Titus served Tobago and Trinidad for his entire life with love, with pride, and with unwavering commitment. In his role as a lifelong educator, he was awarded the National Teacher of the Year in 1974 and 1975. And in his role as a cultural ambassador, he was celebrated as a Calypsonian known by the unforgettable Calypso sobriquet, Axback, which Senator Dylan Remy just told us how he became. By the turn of the century, Royal Titus's work expanded to his selfless service in the Senate in the Seventh Republican Parliament. He began his electoral service as a government senator, and by the Eighth Parliament was later elected the vice president of the Senate. Such was his devotion to the country, to culture, and to the youth. His works and service to this country will never be forgotten, and he has the nation's fullest gratitude. Honorable Senators, I will ask you to please stand so that we can observe a minute of silence in honor of both former Senator and Vice President of the Senate, Royal Titus.
May his soul rest in peace. Thank you, honorable senators. I now instruct the clerk to convey to the family of Mr. Royal Titus the sentiments expressed today. Bills brought from the House of Representatives on the Supplemental Order People, the Finance Supplementary Appropriation Financial Year 2022 Bill 2023 in the name of the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Mr. President, in accordance with Standing Order 621B, I beg to move that the next stage of the bill will be, ta be taken later in the proceedings. Honorable Senators, the question is that the next stage of the bill be taken later in the proceedings. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The next stage of the bill will be taken later in the proceedings. Papers. Acting Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I have the honor to lay on the table the following papers as listed on the order paper and supplemental order paper in the names of the Minister of National Security the Minister of Public Utilities, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Energy and Energy Industries, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Planning and Development, the Minister of Youth Development and National Service, the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government, and the Minister of Labour. The Annual Administrative Report of the National Helicopter Services Limited for Fiscal Year 2019-2020. The Audited and Consolidated Financial Statements of the Trinidad Tobago Electricity Commission for the year ended December 31, 2021. The Annual Administrative Report of the Ministry of Finance for Fiscal Year 2019-2020. The Report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the Financial Statements of the Princess Town Regional Corporation for the year ended September 30, 2019. The Report of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago on the Financial Statements of the Princess Town Regional Corporation, Chairman's Fund Account for the year ended September 30, 2020. The Annual Report of the Financial Intelligence Unit of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ended September 30, 2022. The Response of the Auditor General of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago to the Sixth Report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination into the internal controls, expenditure, and the accessibility and availability of diagnostic imaging services at public health institutions with specific reference to the Tobago Regional Health Authority. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to the seventh report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination into the implementation of the Public Sector Investment Programme for fiscal year 2021. The, minister, the ministerial response for the Ministry of National Security to the seventh report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination into the implementation of the Public Sector Investment Programme for fiscal year 2021. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Health to the seventh report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination into the implementation of the Public Sector Investment Programme for fiscal year 2021. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Planning and Development to the seventh report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination into the implementation of the Public Sector Investment Programme for fiscal year 2021. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service to the seventh report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination into the implementation of the Public, Service, Public Sector sorry, Investment Programme for fiscal year 2021. The ministerial response of the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government to the seventh report of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee on the examination into the implementation of the Public Sector Investment Programme for fiscal year 2021. The annual administrative reports of the Industrial Relations Advisory Committee for the periods October 12th, sorry, sorry, October 20, 2012 to September 2013 and October 2018 to September 2019. Thank you. Reports from committees. Senator Paul Richards. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Good afternoon, colleagues. Mr. President, I have the honor to present the following report as listed on the supplemental order paper in my name. The fourth report of the Joint Select Committee on Social Services and Public Administration, third session, 2022-2023, 12th Parliament, 
on an inquiry into the mental health and psychosocial services available to the population during the COVID-19 pandemic, with specific focus on measures to curb substance abuse and suicide. Thank you. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. President. To the Honorable Minister of Tourism, Culture, and the Arts, given reports that the construction of the North Stern at the Queen's Park Savannah has been halted due to stolen steel beams. Can the minister indicate what measures are being taken to ensure the completion of work for Carnival 2023? Thank you, Mr. President. The NCC has advised that the replacement beams have been purchased, fabricated, and the North Stand will be completed on or before the 2nd of February, 2023. Senator Mark. Can I ask the Honorable Minister if any efforts have been made, as far as he's aware, to apprehend those who were responsible for the removal of those steel beams? Minister of Tourism. Mr. President, an internal investigation has commenced, as well as a report has been made to the police, and the police are conducting inquiries. Senator Mark. Can the minister indicate whether the NCC has attached any value in terms of quantity of monies lost temporarily until those steel beams are retrieved? Minister of Tourism. Mr. President, I'm not armed with that information, but I'm sure if he poses the question in the appropriate way, I will get that answer for him. Senator Mark, next urgent question. To the Minister of Public Utilities, given reports that a damaged 42-inch transmission line in Santa Rosa has caused over 75,000 residents of Arima and environs to be without a portable water supply, can the minister advise when will the water supply be restored? Minister of Public Utilities. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, last Thursday, January the 19th, a rupture was discovered on the water and sewage 42-inch diameter transmission line, which transmits water from the North Oropooch Water Treatment Plant, located in Valencia. The ruptured transmission line runs cross-country through parts of Valencia along the Churchill-Roosevelt Highway to Piaco. Along the route, there are different offtakes which serves communities such as Brazil, Maloney, La Hoqueta, Omera, Tompuna, and Malaba. Immediately on the discovery of the rupture, an emergency wasser crew was mobilized and dispatched to repair the ruptured main so as to ensure an early restoration of the supply of water to some 120,000 customers affected in the communities identified. Mr. President, the repair will prove to be extremely difficult. The damaged section of pipeline, which was partially submerged by Mausica River, had to be removed and be replaced by a section of steel main. During repair works, a masonry rubble wall on the eastern side of the river collapsed onto the work area, further dislodging the 42-inch transmission main. Additional heavy equipment had to be mobilized on site to assist with additional works, with such slope stabilization and removal of reinforced concrete footing to access the main. Mr. Vice President, Mr. President I'm sorry, the restoration work was completed on Tuesday, January the 24th at around 8.30 p.m., and the water supply has been restored to the affected communities. Senator Mark. 
Mr. Yeah, Mr. President, can the minister indicate whether this damaged 42-inch transmission line was damaged or was um, the subject of deliberate sabotage or was it a natural occurrence through aged pipelines? Minister of Public Utilities. Mr. President, I wish to dispel any notion that this ruptured transmission line was damaged as a result of any sabotage by external parties. Um, it is as a result of the shifting earth in that area on the river bank and the movement of the pipeline over a period of time. The investigation would have resulted in the fact that this transmission line was dislodged as a result of the earth movement taking place in the area. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll go on to the next question. To the Minister of Health, in light of the increase in COVID-19 deaths in recent days, can the Minister indicate what public education measures are being implemented during this carnival period? Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and may I offer my heartiest congratulations to you on your appointment, and may I say a very happy new year to all members of this chamber. Uh, the question I suppose is a little bit misleading about increase in deaths. We look at trends over time. For the past four reporting periods, 3rd January, deaths uh, per day by week, one. 10th January, one. 17 January, two, and for the 24th of January, back to one. There is no sustainable trend of increase in deaths. Two, our seven-day rolling day average of cases hovers between 54 and 74 for the same four-week reporting period. Our hospital numbers oscillate between 65 and 75, that is 70 plus or minus five for the same period. So the numbers are basically static and there is no increase in trend over time. However, in an effort to be proactive, we continue to advise the, of the public health measures of masking, washing hands and social distances social distancing are still highly recommended for the vulnerable and immunocompromised, especially those with comorbidities, those who are obese, the elderly, the unvaccinated. You will see ticker tape messages on both um, national channels. We have maintained the masking at all health facilities, public and private. The Ministry of Health's website um, continues to publish all the necessary guidelines and we relaunch an aggressive vaccination drive for 2023 for both COVID and influenza because both of them have the capacity to overwhelm a healthcare center um, uh, system. To date in that period, over 7,000 doses of both COVID and influenza vaccines have been administered. Unlike other countries, we have never de-escalated or stopped advising people to wear in masking. Additionally, Minister, time is up. Thank you. Senator Mark. Yeah. Um, Mr. President, may I ask the Honorable Minister whether the recent reports of 11 deaths was clearly a misleading statement coming out from a bulletin issued by the Ministry of Health? Minister of Health. I'm just trying to get guidance. It was not a misleading statement. The numbers of deaths per week hover between one for 3rd January, one 10 January, two for 17 January. Obviously, we reported it. And the 24th of January, one. So there is no prolonged increase. One week does not a trend make. Additionally, uh, Mr. President, 
specifically for Carnival. We are, we are partnering with Boom Champions at the Eddie Hart grounds to do screening. And at all our screening activities at the Great Paps May Initiative, we screen people for their comorbidities so they could be advised to get vaccinated. At the Eddie Hart grounds, we actually got five people who were screened for hypertension and were stopped from taking part in the physical activity because of their high blood pressure. This is the value of screening and knowing your numbers, and then they are advised. So Mr. President, in closing, we urge all unvaccinated to simply get vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Senators, the time for urgent questions has ended. Questions on notice, questions for oral answer. Acting Leader of Government Business, Mr. President, the government is in a position to answer all three oral questions on the order paper today. Okay. Senator Mark. Yes. Question number 26 to the Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Uh, you're not asking question number 25, Senator Mark. Yeah. Question number 25, sorry, Mr. President. Question number 25 to the Minister of Education. Acting Leader of Government Business. Thank you, Mr. President. As part of the government's social safety net, a total of 270,746,000 $800 has been allocated to the National Schools Dietary Services Limited for fiscal 2023. This sum has been determined to be sufficient to supply meals in this academic year for all students in all schools who have been identified as requiring this free service. Should additional funding be required, the Ministry of Education will approach the Ministry of Finance. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can the minister, or is the minister in a position to inform the Senate how many students and pupils will be able to access these meals given the sum outlined? Thank you. Whilst I don't have the exact numbers, what I can say is that all requests for school feeding are being fulfilled at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I go on now to the question number that I posed a short while ago to agriculture. Should I repose it and um, restate it, Mr. You can, I, for yeah. procedural purposes. Yeah. Question number 26 to the Minister of Agriculture, Land and fisheries. Minister of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, as a result of reports with respect to large-scale looting of farmers, crops, and livestock, the Ministry of Agriculture, Land, and Fisheries has been actively assessing the operations of the Predia Larceny Squad. Currently, the unit operates with a total of 33 officers in various positions. Due to the height heightening illegal activity impacting our farmers, the Predia Larceny Squad has been utilizing its connection with the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service, that's the TTPS, the Trinidad and Tobago Municipal Police Service, and the Estate Management and Business Development Company Limited Police in order to respond and assist. The unit has been making adjustments in order to realign with the current needs based on reports received. This is to facilitate an adequate response utilizing the officers we have in the short term. The Ministry is seeking to engage more officers in the medium term through recruitment. 
While the ministry awaits the full complement of staff for the squad, the officers have also established communication lines with the various farmers groups throughout the country, so they are aware of the affected farmers or areas where predial larceny is taking place. In this way, we can respond utilizing the support system previously mentioned with the TTPS, the Municipal Police, and the EMBD Police. Mr. President, it should also be noted that the Ministry, in the, in the process of, pre, of procuring three new fully equipped vehicles at this stage of evaluation and an award of contract is expected by 2023, February next month, is it? It is anticipated that this will improve the ability of officers to conduct patrols. In closing, I would like to reaffirm that the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries is committed to address the concerns of the Predia Larceny squads and all personnel under this remit. Senator Mark. Mr. President, based on what the Honorable Minister said, that there are some 33 um, personnel on the establishment of the Predia Larceny Unit. Can the Minister advise this Honorable Senate how many personnel are actually on the job as we speak within the Predia Larceny Unit? The, the Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. There are 33 employees employed right now. We are in the process with the Ministry of Public Administration to add additional 40 officers based on the availability of funding, we'll, we'll employ more, but we are in the process right now, 33 plus the 40. So I am, as I said before, last week, I am on top of this and I am in connection with the Pudia Larceny Squad. I had two meetings with them and I intend to continue having meetings with them until we solve this problem. President, through you to the Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister, can you share with us whether the Ministry of Agriculture, which you head, has done any audit of the losses experienced thus far by farmers through brazen looting by criminal elements who invade these farmers' private spaces? Has the Ministry done an audit of the losses experienced by farmers thus far? Minister. I will have to get that information to you. But in, in, in light of that question, I would like to appeal to the public, when you want to do these looting with animals and crops and so on, plant your own, plant your own crops and mine your own animals. And then we then 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 we will really know what we're getting because right now people taking months and years to, to grow a minor animal and sell it and, and take some time to plant these crops and to just come in and, and loot it. So I I believe I am making an appeal to the public who are doing these illegal activities because we at the ministry, the, 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 the staff at the ministry, we are working feverishly. And since I came in there, I have been. I, I want to. I want to get this Pudia Larceny squad going. So that is my appeal to the public out there. Senator Mark. Yeah, um, Mr. President, can I ask the Honourable Minister whether once a proper audit is conducted on the losses experienced by farmers, would the minister be in a position through the ministry? to facilitate some element of compensation to the farmers for losses experienced. Is that a consideration under your particular review at this time? Minister. Oh. Thank you, Mr. President and Senator Mark. I don't act on my own at the ministry. I will have consultation done with the permanent secretary and the relevant staff. And if the need arises, we'll look into it. And the final question, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President Raga, um, my apologies, is this. Um, 
can the minister indicate to this Honorable Senate a possible time frame for the beefing up of your of the Pradia Lassani unit from the 33 to that additional 40, which will bring them to 73. Is there a timeline given the suffering that farmers are now experiencing through looting of their crops? Is there a time frame you have put down as a red line in the sand for those recruitments? Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Mark, I want to assure you and assure the public, as I said before, the process is ongoing. Um, right now, we are waiting a response, as I said, from the Ministry of um, Public Administration to get the recruitment process going. So I think in a couple, by, the, by a couple of months' time, because there's a process, and you know there's, there's, there's stringent measures, you deliver the public service, and nothing happens overnight in the public service. I have been in the public service for years. So we will get this going, and I assure you and the public, the, the farmers out there will rest assured we, are, we have an all-of-government approach, which is, which is the TTPS, the municipal police, and the strengthening of the, uh, the Pridia Larceny. We will try to assist the farmers as, as far as possible. But not forgetting, I'm making an appeal to the public Senator Mark, Mr. President, that you want to steal an animal, mind your own animals. You want to, to, to interfere with people, crops who take the time and, and months to plant, plant your own because everybody needs to plant. It's a time where food is very important in this country and all over the world. So plant your own crops and mind your own animals and leave the people stuck alone. Senator Mark, next question on the order paper. Thank you, Mr. President. Question number 27 to the Honorable Prime Minister. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. President. This question is misleading. Since no efforts are being made by NIDCO or China Railway Construction Caribbean Limited to displace residents of silk cotton trace extension in Bonacord, Tobago without compensation. It is a matter of public record that lands in the vicinity of silk cotton trace extension need to be acquired for the construction of the new airport terminal at the ANR Robinson International Airport. It should also be noted that the client ministry for this particular construction project is the Ministry of Finance. The project manager is the National Infrastructure Development Company and the design build contractor is China Railway Construction Caribbean Limited. Land acquisition for the new airport terminal is being pursued in accordance with the law in four zones which have been established based on the project's priorities. To date, 95% of Zone A, 85% of Zone B, 91% of Zone C, and 25% of Zone D have been acquired and handed over to the contractor to commence construction. A total of 133 properties are required to be acquired, and so far, approximately 90% of these properties have been acquired. Further, the estimated cost of land acquisition for the new airport terminal and associated works at the ANR Robinson International Airport is $300 million. 
and to date, the total payments for land acquisition for the project amount to $237,791,954. It is a fallacy, therefore, to say or even insinuate that residents are being displaced without compensation. It should be noted that it is the intention of NIDCO to complete all land acquisition required to facilitate the construction of the new airport terminal and to treat all affected residents and or landowners fairly and equitably. Residents are assured that all payments for compensation that are due and payable under the Land Acquisition Act Chapter 5801 will be made in accordance with the law. Mr. Mark. Yeah. Mr. President, having regard to the timeline that the government has set for the construction of the airport, extension of that airport in Tobago, can the minister indicate whether the government has given itself an estimated time for the completion of land acquisition so that the project can be completed on time and within budget? I want to allow that question, Senator Mark. Next question. Can the minister indicate how many of the one 33 property owners um, are still engaged and is there any time frame for concluding those arrangements as it relates to final compensation? Yes, sir, finance. As I indicated, about 90% of the 133 properties to be acquired have been acquired. The balance are in various stages of acquisition. Senator Mark? Indicate what, what are some of the factors or issues that might be holding up this process from its ultimate completion? What are some of the challenges, in other words? I want to allow that question, Senator Mark. Last question. I, I, I pause at this time. Thank you very much. Public business, government business, bills second reading. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. President. I beg to move that a bill entitled an act to provide for further supplementary appropriation for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending 30th of September 2022 be now read a second time. Mr. President, the matter before the Senate is a bill which has two clauses and a schedule. And in these two clauses, the first clause is the title, and the second clause requests a further issue from the Consolidated Fund in the sum of $815,567,165 to meet expenditure for fiscal 2022. That was not originally appropriated. There are just two heads to be increased. Head 40, which we are asking be increased by $800 million, and that is Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries, and Head 65, Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs, for which we are asking the head be increased by $15,567,165. So that's how you get the $815 million $567,165. We 
With respect to the details of just those two heads, because, Mr. President, I am staying in my section, I am dealing only with the bill before the House. I am dealing only with the supplementary appropriation, the request for a supplementary appropriation for these two heads of expenditure. And I am not dealing with the transfers which were given, the explanations and so on were given to the Senate because those do not form, form any part of this bill or this debate. Now, the 800 million for the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries is being sought to retire two advances from Treasury deposits that facilitated payments of fuel subsidy owed to Trinidad and Tobago National Petroleum Marketing Company, NP, and the United Independent Petroleum Marketing Company, UNIPED. By way of explanation, in accordance with Section 17.1b of the Exchequer and Audit Act, Chapter 6901, advances made from Treasury deposits are recoverable within 12 months after the close of the financial year in which the advances are made. However, the accounts must be closed within four months of the end of the financial year. And since our financial year ends on the 30th of September, it is a requirement that the accounts for any fiscal year be closed by January 31st of the following year. The purpose of the 800 million was to deal with unforeseen expenditure on the fuel subsidy that arose from the exponential increase in the price of oil over the period, I would say January to September 2022. We had pegged the budget on an oil price of $65 and there was an assumption based on that price and based on the fuel prices prevailing at the time of the 2022 budget, which would have been read in October 2021, there was a, an assumption based on the budget price of $65 per barrel for oil that the subsidy would be somewhere in the vicinity of three, four hundred million dollars. And it would have been in that range if oil prices had remained within the $65 range. But following the invasion in U of Ukraine in the first quarter of 20 2022, that's calendar 2022 I'm speaking about, we saw huge increases in the price of oil going as high as $130 at one point in time. Now, the price of oil is, as I've said in the other place, a double-edged sword. Because even though you will get additional revenue from an increased oil price, motor fuels, gasoline, diesel, etc., are based on the price of oil, because gasoline and diesel is a processed product derived from crude oil. So as the price of crude oil goes up, the price of gasoline, the price of, of fuel oil, the price of diesel, etc., go up. So that while you get additional revenue, you also find yourself having to pay a huge additional subsidy that you never expected. And in fact, if the prices had kept at that 130 dollar level, we might have found ourselves paying a fuel subsidy in 2022 of $3 billion. As it was, when you average out the price from October 2021 to September 2022, we found that the 
actual requirement for a fuel subsidy was in excess of $2.4 billion, $2.45 billion, somewhere around there. So that as the year went along, we found it necessary to find ways and means of sending money to Paria, who is the ultimate recipient, because even though the money goes to NP and it goes to Unipet, it's for onward payment to Paria, because they are buying fuel at world market prices. So Paria has to pay whatever the, the world market price is, usually the East Coast United States ex-refinery price, and they sell the fuel to NP and Unipet at the scheduled price in, at, at the gas station, and then the government makes up the difference by way of the fuel subsidy. So even though the money went to NP and Unipet, it was simply passing through on its way to Paria to reimburse Paria for the fuel it had purchased at the very, very high prices. The whole situation was extremely volatile. It could not have been budgeted for. And therefore, we used a mechanism which is to use treasury deposits, which you can. You are allowed to use treasury deposits in unforeseen circumstances or extraordinary circumstances in an emergency. You are allowed to use treasury deposits. But once you do that, you have to bring them to account. And this is what we're doing here. The actual money spent by September 30th, and I explained this in the other place as well, that government operates on a cash basis. So even so, if you have a payment that you make on the 1st of October, it goes to the next financial year and is not counted under the previous financial year, which would have end, ended a day before. So that the money that we actually put out was close to $1.7 billion in, in cash that we sent to NP and Uniped to, set, to give to Paria, which was at least $800 million more. It was, in fact, a little more than we had allocated, but we were able to make some other adjustments to make up the difference after we sent that $800 million through the Ministry of Energy to the companies, and then the Ministry of Energy also used its allocation for fuel subsidy, and then we got funds from the petroleum levy to assist in paying that subsidy. So that is what occurred, and it is now necessary to bring to account that $800 million, which was not foreseen. The other item, which is the second head that we are dealing with here, head 65, Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. And we are asking for an increase in the appropriation to the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs in the amount of $15,567,165. Of this, $4,877,843 is needed to make up a shortfall in the allocation for the repairs and maintenance of buildings. The 2022 allocation for the repairs and maintenance of buildings under Head 65, subhead 02-00221, was 5325000 but again, because of unforeseen circumstances, this head is required to be increased to $10,202,843. And in, in the main, the additional expenditure is in, required to cater for critical repairs to chanceries and residences abroad. The severe winter storms at the end of 2021 affected three missions in North America, the embassy in Washington, D.C., the consulate general in New York, and the consulate general in Toronto. Money was required for snow removal, plumbing inspection and repair, removal of material from affected areas, cleanup fees, mold assessment, purchase of materials, disinfecting, sanitization, removal of water-soaked carpets, 
and so on. And in addition, because all of these buildings suffered damage and loss because of the severe winter storm, the common user charges that were imposed by the landlords also increased during fiscal 2022. Again, something that could not possibly have been foreseen. I'll give further breakdowns for the embassy in Washington. The winter storm damage cost $3,077,081 TT or US 439.583. And money was spent on elevator maintenance, grounds maintenance, snow removal, plumbing repairs, installations, pest control, and so on. And that came up to the total there, three million seventy-seven thousand eighty-one dollars In the Consulate General in New York, there were repairs to the patio at the official residence, repairs to the service room, the air conditioning control, and so on. And that came up to 72,505 US dollars or 507,535 dollars. So when you add everything up, you get the 4 million 877,000. Again, because of all sorts of volatility in the international environment, there was a requirement for increased expenditure on security and an increase in the 2022 allocation for security services at various embassies and missions is required from 2,413,000 to 6,471,110 dollars and I can give some details at the High Commission in London the additional expenditure is just around 230,000 the embassy in Brasilia 460,000 the High Commission in Pretoria, 851,000. The Embassy in Caracas, 460,000. The High Commission in Georgetown, 585,000. The High Commission in Abuja, 125,000. High Commission Jamaica, 927,000. The Embassy in Washington, 237,000. The Consulate General in Toronto, 167,000. And the Consulate General in Miami, 10,000 making a total uh, new allocation of 6,471,000. And again, Mr. President, none of this is easily predicted. One does not know what the security situation will be in all of these countries. It's always in flux. And these uh, security expenses were not foreseen at the budget time. And also, security agencies all over the world are increasing their fees and charging more. And therefore, that is why we are requesting an additional sum for security for all of those missions and embassies I just mentioned. With respect to housing, we are asking for an additional 4,656,700 to meet additional expenditure. Heads of mission assumed duty in the 2022 fiscal year in Venezuela, Caracas, Miami, USA, China, United Kingdom, and South Africa. A consul, public affairs and culture, also assumed duty at the consulate general in Miami during the period. The costs involved include temporary hotel accommodation, where government-owned property was not ready for occupancy, in a, including the areas where government-owned property had been damaged by the winter storms. And the following is a breakdown by mission. 189,000 U.S. in Caracas, 24,000 U.S. in Georgetown, 63,000 U.S. in Miami, 41,000 U.S. in Beijing, and then in Ottawa, 77,000 U.S., in New Delhi, 206,000 U.S., in Washington, 44,000, in Brussels, 18,000, making a total request for additional expenditure for accommodation in all of these missions, 
so about nine of them, of 4,654,000. And again, Mr. President, one cannot predict when a country will be ready to receive an ambassador or high commissioner because it's quite a detailed process. I am not no expert in this area, but I do know that there is something called an agreement which must be settled and signed by the two countries and then there's quite a lot of process that takes place before the High Commissioner or Ambassador can take up residence in the particular country. And therefore, again, it's very difficult to predict when these things will happen. And therefore, in the budget process, estimates are made and then supplemented in this way. With respect to medical expenses, again, due to COVID, which has affected the cost of uh, medical treatment all over the world, we are asking for an additional $1,974,510 for the four missions in the United States of America and the embassy in Beijing. And this is for the medical plan. And what we are told is the health plan, the cost of the health plan in the four missions in the USA and the embassy in China increased by 20% in fiscal 2022 and that would have happened during the year, and therefore very difficult to predict. And this medical plan deals with both home-based and locally recruited staff. And to give some details, the increased cost of, for the medical plan in Washington, 51,000 US, in Beijing, 92,000 US, in the permanent mission to the United Nations, 50,000, the Consulate General New York, 40,000, and the Consulate General Miami, 47,000. Total of 282,000 US dollars, or 1,974,511. So those are all the details for the additional expenditure of $15,567,165. And I want to make the point because <coughs> Opposition members made heavy weather of a point in the other place. Of course, they were totally wrong. And we have insurance for all of our buildings, in all of our missions, in all of the countries in which Trinidad and Tobago has representation. But when you have a winter storm and the roof is destroyed, the carpet is flooded, the windows are gone, the pipes have burst, the driveway is destroyed. One cannot wait for the insurance injustors to do their inspections, to negotiate with the insurance broker or directly with the mission itself. And then eventually after quite a long period of time, a payment is made. One cannot wait until the process of negotiation, inspection, evaluation of damage to a, a mission is completed and you get the payment from the insurance company and then you start to fix the roof because while all of that is going on, your mission will be shut down. So what the various missions did very wisely is that they sought and obtained approval to receive this additional money. They went ahead, they did the repairs to make sure the staff were comfortable, to make sure that the missions could function to make sure we had proper representation and then made a claim against the insurance company because there was a big song and dance in the other place that why aren't we insuring the buildings? Of course the buildings are insured, but anybody who has any knowledge of, of property insurance will know that it takes quite a while to reach a settlement with an insurance company with respect to a claim for loss and damage. And it would have been foolhardy of the government to just sit down there and wait for that process to be completed before doing things as important as fixing the roof and the electrical and the plumbing, critical elements of the various buildings. Now, the uninitiated may be tempted to believe that because we are supplementing the appropriation in the sum of $815 million, 
that somehow the expenditure in 2022 went up by $815 million. That is not so. We are simply getting parliamentary approval for the appropriation. But there would have been savings elsewhere in other heads of expenditure. And therefore, to avoid, as best as I can, because one never knows what honorable members on the lower bench will say, but in an attempt to avoid, I want to make it crystal clear that this additional 815 million did not affect the expenditure or revenue already announced by my good self in terms of the outturn for fiscal 2022. And I want to confirm that after we received all the reports from permanent secretaries and other accounting officers in various government agencies, ministries, and departments, the revenue for 2022 came in at 54.2 million and the expenditure came in at 53.1 sorry 54.2 billion and the expenditure came in at 53.1 billion resulting in a surplus of 1.08 billion dollars so our expenditure for the first time in 14 years since 2008 for the first time in 14 years our expenditure was less than our revenue and with those words mr president having stuck to my script and stayed far away from extraneous matters and dealt only with the two heads of expenditure we are seeking to supplement in this bill I beg to move. Honorable Senators, I shall now propose the question for debate. The question is that a bill entitled an act to provide for a further supplementary appropriation for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending 30th of September 2022 be now read a second time. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, like the Honorable Minister of Finance, I too intend to stick to the boundaries that we have before us as manifested in the bill called the financial, the finance rather, supplementary appropriation Financial Year 2022, Bill 2023. And in doing so, I want to begin by saying, open and accountable government is the best cornerstone for any genuine democracy. I say further, the best disinfectant for secrecy is the sunshine of transparency. I intend to ask a series of questions 
arising out of the very items that the Honorable Minister addressed in his contribution. To allow the population to have an understanding or a better understanding of why we are here today. Mr. President, we are told by the Honorable Minister that because of unforeseen circumstances, coupled with volatility in the international global energy market, several matters could not have been anticipated. And therefore, certain steps had to be taken. And what were these steps, Mr. President? The government, using the Treasury deposits, went into the People's Consolidated Fund to extract in advance, 815 million dollars. To deal with what, Mr. President? Two items. One, subsidies amounting to 800 million dollars to be paid to National Petroleum and Unipet. The minister did not tell us, or I think he did, I beg your pardon. It came in two tranches. In the month of July, $400 million. And coming to the close of the fiscal year, September 30th, another $400 million. Both went to NP and Unipet. The minister also took us on a brief journey to his 2022 budgetary statement because it is the books for 2022 that we are seeking to close because the 31st of January is the deadline. That is why we are here today. So what are we told by the minister in an effort to rationalize? He's going into the consolidated fund using treasury deposits to extract $800 million and we are now being called upon by the government, through the Minister of Finance, to lend our approval for this expenditure, which happened in July and which happened in September. Now, We were told, and it's a fact, in the 2022 budget, the minister projected oil price at 65 US dollars a barrel. But in February of 2022, as he, as he rightly stated, there was an invasion of Ukraine by Russia. The rest is history. However, the price of oil went sky high, as we were advised. Well, Mr. President, 
Did not the minister have a media review? Yes, the evidence is here. There was a media review in 2022, in May of 2022, where he came and appropriated three billion eighty one million dollars in additional expenditure out of an eleven billion dollars this parliament was told Trinidad and Tobago realized as a result of higher oil prices. Mr President when I looked at the midterm review 29 heads of expenditure got some allocation on the recurrent expenditure, amounting to close to $3 billion, with capital expenditure being just about $104 million. At that time, Mr. President, what did the minister do? in terms of subsidies, reallocation to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. It is here in the midterm review. He allocated three, the Honorable Minister, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President rather, allocated $300 million. That was the allocation in the mid-year review. When the minister himself admitted, Mr. President, that the price of oil went up into the $124 region per barrel. But we are being advised today by the Honorable Minister, that because of unforeseen circumstances and the volatility of the global energy marketplace, the government was unable to properly project, properly plan the allocation needed for subsidies to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries that would ultimately have to go to NP and UNIPET. Because they are the ones who are collecting VAT. They are the ones who are collecting subsidy and have to retrieve and direct same to the Ministry of Finance, who then, Mr. President, have to give paria monies, a long convoluted bureaucratic arrangement. This government has to start thinking outside of the box. And I'll give you some ideas if you don't have any. You seem to be in a state of gridlock when it comes to intellectual debt. So Mr. Vice President, Mr. President Raga, I want to share with this Honorable Senate <laughs> the 2023 budget. And you know what is nice about the 2023 budget, Mr. Pre Mr. President? Is that the Minister of Finance in the 2023 budget admitted He confessed that he, the Honorable Minister that is, and his technocrats, from the month of February, when the invasion took place in Ukraine, they had oil prices under constant review and supervision. 
So if you had oil prices under constant review and supervision, Mr. President, the government must explain to the nation how come the government was caught flat-footed? How come the government could not have projected the kind of subsidy that they would have needed and therefore, if they missed it in the budget, they could have taken it up in the midterm review. And the midterm review showed that only $300 million was allocated to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries in so far as subsidies were concerned. And that was in the month of May 2022. Mr. President, the minister could have come and tell us in the parliament in the month of September before the budget was presented in October or in September, I think it was presented in late September, if I'm not mistaken. We could have been told by the minister, either through a statement, our minister of finance is always on Twitter, tweeting, giving information on all kinds of things. How come the minister of finance, Mr. President, did not find himself on Twitter telling the country, here what's going on. We have allocated in two tranches through the consolidated fund that you got no formal authorization to access. Yes, Mr. V Mr. President, under the Exchequer and Audit Act, Section 17.1b gives the Minister of Finance the authority to access the consolidated fund through the Treasury deposits. Yes, you have that legal authority. Yes, the Cabinet can give you the authority, Mr. President, to get into that consolidated fund through Treasury deposit as they did with the $815 million that we are now debating and they are seeking our approval for. Why did not the minister use Twitter to tell Trinidad and Tobago $800 million, $815 million was being taken out of the consolidated fund? Not at all. We were never advised. There was no transparency. There was no accountability. There was no scrutiny. There was no probity. There was no debate. We are now debating $815 million. Out of that, $800 million went to subsidies. But I, we are now debating, Mr. Va Mr. President, after the fact. Stable, close, horse bolted, rubber stamp. So we are being asked today to debate a matter that has already been concluded. It is only because, Mr. President, the financial year is about to close in a few days from now, the 31st of January, Mr. President, that we are being asked to approve 815 
million dollars. Mr. President, is it fair to the people of Trinidad and Tobago? I am saying it is allowable, it is legal. I'm not arguing the legality, Mr. President. I'm asking whether it was necessary. Was it necessary? Is the government hoodwinking this parliament by telling us because of unforeseen circumstances we could not have been alerted through a formal debate in this parliament for $815 million in the month of June or in the media review. Why? Mr. Vice President, I ask you to join me. If you don't have a copy, join me. I take you to page I think it's um, 173, if I'm not mistaken. No, 151 of the 2023 budget. And Mr. Vice, Mr. President, if you will bear with me for a few moments, you will understand why you, you as president, I want to say you, why this honorable Senate is being taken for a ride. You'll understand on these two items that we are dealing with here today. Hear what we were told in the 2023 budget. The same Minister of Finance who is telling us that because of unforeseen circumstances and because of the volatility of global energy prices, they couldn't predict and therefore they couldn't allocate and therefore, they had to go in the treasury, in the consolidated fund, to extract $815 million. And they are now coming to retire it by seeking our approval when it is already a done deal. Hear what we were told, and I quote. On page 151, Madam Speaker, I, I want to go slowly with the language, you know, so you can understand the implications of what we are dealing with here today. Madam Speaker, I have kept under review the changing oil prices in 2022. The Minister of Finance is confessing in his 2023 budget that he kept under constant review the global oil prices that were changing and were in a state of volatility. He goes on, or this quotation goes on rather. Mr. President, US $100 per barrel in February 2022, following the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. This is what the minister is saying. In February, the price was 100 US dollars. It does not stop there, Mr. President. We are further informed, US $125 million per barrel in March of 2022 in response to the ban by the United States on Russian fuel exports. Mr. President, the minister is outlining in budget 2023 how he kept under constant review the volatility 
of oil prices that we had budgeted at $65 US per barrel. He, it goes on, that is the budget statement. On page 151, US 125 per barrel in June 2022 as concerns about supply emerged. Again, Mr. President, this is in the month of June. The minister is telling Trinidad and Tobago that he had the price of oil under review. And at that time, it was 125 US dollars per barrel. Mr. Pres Mr. President, I go on, on page 152 of the 2023 budget statement. US $99 per barrel in August of 2022. And US $87 on September the 23rd, 2022. And US, yes, uh, standing order 46.1. This is not a budget debate or a review of the budget um, commentary on so on. I think we need to get to the point of this the is not a reason. Okay, so Senator Mark, in terms of the point of order raised, I think you've made your point in relation to going back to comments by the Minister of Finance in the budget presentation of last year and you've connected it to statements that were made uh, in this particular proceedings today. So I would ask you now to move on from that. There's no need to go back to the budget presentation. Mr. President, uh, I'll move you, on. So Senator Mark, from on. what I've heard thus far from you, you've made that point. There's no need to bring back up uh, the budget debate any further. So I would ask you to, to move on. Senator Mark, Senator Mark. I'm guys. So I, I'm gonna pause. I know that the government came out, not you. The government came out to curtail this debate. They came out to curtail this debate. So, Senator Mark, again, you have to be aware of certain imputations as it relates to the statements that you're making. So, once again, I'll ask you to move on to your next point. Mr. Mr. President, the simple point I am making is that the government led by the Minister of Finance in this instance, I know he's the Deputy Prime Minister because he's a, de he's a Deputy Political Leader, right? The Minister of Finance told this parliament today that because of circumstances, the government did not and could not budget subsidies in 2022 and caused the government to go into the consolidated fund through treasury deposits. I am putting it to this honorable Senate that based on a confession by the Minister of Finance on page 151 and 52 of the budget, the minister had adequate knowledge and the minister therefore could have allocated from our budget, particularly when he came with the $3 billion in the midterm review to properly allocate the sum to subsidies to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. The question, Mr. President, that we have to ask is why did the minister not allocate more money towards subsidies in the month of May, in the month of June, in the month of July. Could not the minister indicate if he could not have allocated a statement to Trinidad and Tobago so that we would know what was taking place? So we reject completely 
that flawed argument being advanced by the Honorable Minister that no adequate time was given because of the volatility and the circumstances or unforeseen circumstances that we could not have budgeted properly. Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, let me say something. When, why can't the government think, as I said earlier, outside of the box? Instead of putting pressure on NP and UNIPET, who are to come and beg on their knees for monies that they have collected and passed back on to the minister? Why can the government not pay the subsidies directly to Paria? Why are you going through NP and UNIPET? It is a view, it's an idea the government needs to consider and stop thinking in a fossilized way. Think outside of the box. Because these very owners of NP gas stations and Unipet are experiencing cash flow problems. When they do not get their refund in time. So Mr. President, the subsidy was only given in the month of July and in the month of September. What was happening with these um, NP gas station owners, Unipet um, gas station owners, between the months of February when Russia invaded Ukraine, right up to the money they got in the month of July? And what about August and September? What I'm saying, Mr. President, is that there's need for the government of Trinidad and Tobago to think outside of the box. This point was made already. Relevance 46-1. Senator Mark. You understand what I'm saying, Mr. Vice President? Sorry, sir. I'm sorry to point to you. But I sent to Mark, if you okay. allow me. So the point, that, the point of order that was raised is in relation to relevance, but specifically what I would like to speak to is the repeating of the points that you're making. And I would ask you if you have any new points to bring up right now, please do so. Mr. Vice President, Mr. Oh, I don't know why I call you Vice President. I guess we're custom senior as Vice President. It will take me a little time for, for me to really recognize but I do appreciate your elevation. So you must forgive me if I say Vice President, but it's really Mr. President. My apologies, sir, to you. Mr. President, I know that this fossilized, intellectually bankrupt regime can't see what is being advanced, so they have to rise. I know some of them take exercises because, you know, circulation is important. So that is critical. Mr. President, let me go on to another point because I don't want to detain you nor this honorable Senate any longer on this matter. As you have rightly said, sir, you believe that I have made my point on the subsidy issue. Let's go on now to another hocus pocus. Rubbish argument that they sought to peddle this evening on an unsuspecting population. Hear what they're telling us, you know, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President. You see, winter storm? Nobody could predict that. Mr. Vice President. Why do you think they have forecasters? Why do you think in America they have meteorologists? They forecast things are going to happen. And that is why people in California were ready for floods. So it is rubbish 
nonsense for anybody to come and tell you and me in this parliament that nobody could prepare and be prepared and predict when against winter storm. But Mr. Mr. President, here in Trinidad and Tobago, we know when a hurricane come in and everybody is told to button down. So how can you come and tell Trinidad and Tobago that nobody knew about a winter, a winter storm? And further, Mr. Um, President, security services Unpredictable. Security services, unpredictable. Well, look, we have an honorable colleague here who was sworn in today as a temporary senator. He was a very high-ranking police officer before he arrived on this compound. And this honorable senator will tell you, you can predict events. That is why you have intelligence services. That is why the government has acquired an intelligent software called Pegasus or something close to Pegasus. Relevance, I think we Yes, Senator him. Mark, that particular statement is not relevant to what is before us today. So, Mr. Mr. President, let's look at what they are trying to convince us of today, selling dreams, literally selling us dreams, Mr. President. So let's go to this first item. Under what, Mr. Vice President? Head 65, Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. You know what is sad about this debate today? The utter con Contempt, contumely, disrespect that has been demonstrated to this Senate. We got no information on a breakdown of these items that we are about to debate. You know when we got it? Or got them? When the minister was speaking for the first time. Although the minister had a hard copy. He refused to circulate that document for members' information, knowledge, and consideration. I thought that would have been accompanied by the last bundle of documents that we got. Never came. So want us to debate matters without knowledge, without information. But Mr. President, I... I'm, full, I'm following what's going on. Mr. Vice, Mr. President, look at this one. Look at sub item 21. Repairs and maintenance of building. We are being told that repairs and maintenance of buildings, which came about because of what we have been told, a winter storm in 2021, amounted to almost five million. The correct figures that we have been given is four million eight hundred and seventy seven thousand eight hundred and forty three dollars. And we are being told, Mr President, it went towards repairs to the chancries and residences of our diplomats in Washington, in Toronto, and in Miami. Mr. President, government accessed the 15 million and a couple hundred or a couple thousand dollars to advance to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to deal with this item 
Senator, you have four more minutes. To deal with this item, when, Mr. Vice President, in the month of July to September, when did the Foreign Affairs Ministry get this money? When? Mr. Vice President, Mr. President, we are saying that the government has no policy. And I would like the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, no Minister of Trade, to rise at the appropriate time rather than standing orders, stand and speak on this issue today and indicate to us whether there's a policy on building maintenance or preventative maintenance of our embassies and missions. You would speak at the appropriate time. I would like the Honorable Minister to address the issue of security services. Is there a policy on security services? Is there a policy, Mr. President, on housing? Is there a policy on medical services? Because if there are policies on these matters, Mr. President, we would be able to address these issues when they arise and not be caught flat-footed. So we reject completely these spurious arguments being put forward by this government to convince who? To convince who, Mr. Vice, Mr. President, that they couldn't take action because a winter storm can't, predict, can't, can't be predicted. Um, security services can't pre be predicted. Housing accommodation cannot be predicted. If you have proper policies, those things will never happen. So we do not buy that, Mr. President. So Mr. President, I want to tell you in closing, under this item, that foreign affairs, foreign relations, is an extension of domestic affairs. That is an ABC argument in diplomacy. They are inextricably linked and bound. So, if you have lack of maintenance in the foreign missions, what are you going to have here? Yes, it is the state of our roads, because we have no, we do not have a culture of maintenance in Trinidad and Tobago, whether you're in foreign country or you're in local Trinidad and Tobago. None. And that is why, Mr. President, this situation occurred in those embassies and missions abroad. Because there was, there was no anticipation. Everything was a reaction. And then they come in to justify this thing with some rationalization that are irreprehensible in terms of what they are trying to advance. So, Mr. President, I had a lot more to say. I needed two and a half hours minimum to expose this incompetent regime. But I cannot go on because you have advised me. I have one more minute. Mr. President, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with this very important chamber these critical points, and I think I'll take it on the public platform, not too far from now, to deal with other issues that the government is trying to hoodwink the population all about. I thank you very much, Mr. President. Senator Dial Singh.
Good afternoon, and thank you, Mr. President, for allowing me to partake in this um, discussion, this bill, and congratulations are uh, due for you for occupying this chair. And this bill, it's really an act to provide for a further supplementary appropriation for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending 30th of September 2022. So this really is the finance um, bill 2023 or supplementary appropriation financial for the uh, financial year 2022. And the bill seeks to supplement the appropriation of, um, of this sum the issue of which was authorized by the Appropriation Financial Year 2022 Act 2021, as amended by the Finance um, Act 2022, by authorizing a further issue from the Consolidated Fund in the sum of $815,567,165. So it really seeks to increase the um, the expenditure, the head of expenditure given to the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries and also the Ministry of Foreign and Caricom Affairs. And the Minister of Finance actually went into details what the monies would be given to. And I must say it's really, we are here today because this bill seeks this debate for us to give our blessings in, in, in you know, seeing what was saved in um, certain ministries in there and redistributing this to funds elsewhere. Blessings, I must say, that comes after the fact. However, the reasons for the savings were given in the, in the Appendix 2 that we were uh, afforded from the Minister of Finance, the explanation for the transfers. And I must say, I, the national budget which we had in September was, I think, a well thought of budget. It had given us um, the fact that, you know, we had difficulties ahead. It, it, we saw that even after the budget, there was a rise in fuel, the cost of living. But I saw the injection into the social services, which was an attempt to ease the um, burden of the vulnerable. So while we were here discussing that budget and we had certain, um, certain discussions and certain recommendations made into that budget, um, I actually thought those recommendations would have materialized. However, some didn't, and some ended up into savings. And this is a little concern I had, because on, on the average, if we give a budget, which is a trajectory of, of what the government wants to do with the monies, how to address certain issues, well thought of plans, which could change, as the COVID did change that budget that year, when everything had to, had to turn um, upside down, when the surprise pathogen caused us, that planned budget that came three years ago had to totally change into how we restructure things. So certain um, unexpected, certain, um, uh, certain things that are unexpected would have raised its head. And the minister said a va a, the volatile market would have caused some problems you know, in, in, uh, in him having now to determine where to put those monies. However, so what I may want to say is we had a budget, we had recommendations, and even in our um, GSE meetings, we keep hearing about, about the prevailing issues of, of staffing, running government departments, staffing, uh, which may lead to a failure of services because there were certain staff deficiencies. So we keep hearing this whole team. And what disappointed me about um, the savings, I'm glad we got savings, but part of the savings actually came from um, not achieving proper staffing in a whole set of ministries, the judiciary, the industrial court, um, Ministry of National Security. So it's about five, six ministries where vacant positions were not filled. So I just want to mention that, yes, it was saved. I'm not going into that, but it, it has some concern that, 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 you know, we are taking that money to put it into important avenues, as mentioned by the Minister of Finance. But we might be failing in the delivery of services by not having proper staffing as, as mentioned in this appendix too. And, and I just want to say, um, again, I'd like to welcome the new senator on the uh, government side, a business person, and he might be able to give some input why um, there's this sort of a, a, 
problem in getting the deliver deliverables from the last budget. Why is it we were not able to get those staff in? I mean, so you in your uh, capacity okay, may be so able to help. Senator, yeah. um, as much as I've allowed you to get into your introduction of the presentation that you're making, at this point you're going a bit too broad outside of what is before us. So you've spoken to certain things in the last budget which we connect to here, but I need you to be very tight because what is before us speaks to two things and two things only. So I would need you to get to that and what is occurring there. Thank you, Mr. President. So therefore, as, as I, I appreciate the saving and I have some concerns about how it was saved, I must now say that what do we do with this savings? Is it, is it um, you know, we, we were told it was going into certain, certain avenues. And I must say, if I look at the explanation given by the minister, where it was stated that because oil prices were, you know, $65 per barrel, and then it went $130 per barrel, and now we are in a position where we have to pay the prices that are offered in the international market. And it puts us in a sort of catch-22 position where initially we were a bit happy that we were gaining some, um, something from the, when the price of oil and natural gas would have raised because of the, the war in Ukraine and Russia. But now we have to pay out um, more monies to buy that oil, to give it to NP, Unipet, which will go to reimburse Paris. So it's a, it's a situation where we're gaining some, we're losing some, and, and this is the dilemma we have. So therefore, um, I, I realize the dilemma we have, I realize that, um, and I always try to figure, you know, if we are in this position, what is the light at the end of the rainbow? Is it that we are just stuck into this? But um, I think the good news we have is the dragon field is now being able to develop. We are now dancing there again. The dragon is now allowed to dance. Uh, dance. Senator Mark spoke about the U.S. banning Venezuela exports, but thankfully, the change in geopolitics have now probably would give us that avenue, would probably help us along that stream. So even though we have this concern, we have to be pumping that money now into... NP and Unipet, we may now be able to gain in the future. From this dream, I think government had years ago. So changing geopolitics have certainly given us um, um, the ability to do business with Venezuela, who was our friend before, because if people remember, during um, 1970, the Venezuelans did provide us with a naval ship during that turmoil we had with the revolution. So I'm saying excellent, excellent. Um, initiative is there that I'm thinking we could um, have that um, investment. Some people may criticize it as a long-term investment, but that's the future so, of the country. Senator, again, I'm going to have to caution you. The, the bill speaks to a very specific occurrence happening on the two items to which the Minister of Finance would have spoken to as to the reasons why. It means that this particular debate is extremely tight and can only be engaged in terms of what has been said there. Anything outside of that will fall to irrelevance. So I'm going to ask you to bring it in and tighten it. President. So thank you. So the second issue we noticed is that the Minister Finance said he has to now look at the allocation to actually fix our three um, uh, you know, the, the homes, the ambassadors, our, our business places that we have there in foreign um, co countries, the missions in Washington, New York, Toronto. Monies were needed for snow removal, plumbing repair, um, disinfecting, sanitizing. And I'm saying that um, the level of, of, of repairs in those countries, the first world countries, it's, it's a little more stringent than we have here. For instance, if there is a mold damage, they can actually close down our missions there. If there's any sort of uh, complaint that, that there are certain health hazards. So definitely, um, the government needed to address these issues because I, I have seen homes in Florida closed down for mold's business places. So therefore, uh, monies would have probably been needed to, to help that. And, um, um, the thing is, we have to look at the fact that um, 
a snowstorm is not expected. Hurricane mightn't be expected. I mean, we know it may come in certain times. And usually buildings there are, are somehow equipped to prevent snow damage or hurricane damage. So on one hand, I'm, I'm thinking that if those buildings were there and it's an area where there's winter and there's storms, um, why wasn't those buildings more prepared, more equipped? Uh, you know, if it's a storm that came that was um, of such an intensity, um, I could understand that sort of damage would have been something we could not predict. So I, I look at even the fact that um, uh, when you are looking at the um, cost of, of, of repaying the buildings, the cost sent, Senator Mark, raise a, a point which I think was a little important. He should, we should have probably been provided with a breakdown. So we now would be able to compare our, our missions there really above board. Because you know, by not having a breakdown, we might be opening the doorway where people may be pointing fingers and say, is proper procurement done? Was contracts really, um, three people got contracts? So, so I'm saying that, yes, we, we may have to, um, I would have been a very appreciative if we had gotten that where we would have been able to compare, make a comparison, instead of trying to fish to ascertain the verity of some of these things which we are now hearing today. So here I am trying to figure out, trying to say, you know, I don't know the size of the missions, I don't know um, the layout of the, the ground, so I cannot really make a judgment if the, if the money spent were really spent to the benefit of the taxpayers to get our money's worth. So, um, Mr. Senator Mark's um, suggestion of having a policy in place uh, might be something to guide missions worldwide, so therefore, they would know what is the ceiling that is acceptable to taxpayers if you're going to rent out some properties, if you're going to do some business, that uh, you know one mission in one um, country like Canada wouldn't go above a certain amount on another one. So, so, so to, uh, I, I must agree with Senator Mark's statement with that. However, when I look again at, at one of the other um, aspects where the insurance as, as, as paid out. And the minister said they definitely had to pay out this insurance to get the buildings up to mark because you can't really leave it there for the insurance company to take a while to pay. And I agree with that. And right now there is in fact a major issue with insurance policies in the United States. FIU News, and I would like to quote the October 5th, 2022 issue, an article by Shazed Hamed, where he mentioned in Florida, homeowners are being held at ransom and some homeowners now are without insurance because a very big company, Progressive, actually decided that they were not going to renew 60,000 Florida homeowner policies. That is homeowner and business policies for risk by hurricane, hailstorm and property. So we may have to decide what are we going to do if we are not going to get an adequate insurance to our missions abroad. Some, puts, uh, some places in the United States now have decided, even in flood areas, the government will pay insurance for these individuals. We may have to decide how we are going to address this if we are not going to get insurance um, uh, policies for our missions up there. And this is something that I'm seeing a trend, and um, I think that um, we may have to address this in, a, in future. So then, besides insurance for the buildings, Besides the fact that we needed quick action to prevent mold damage, to get the um, missions going, I also would have, uh, I had a little concern when the minister said that there was a need to increase the security cost. I don't think Trinidad and Tobago is a targeted nation. It, it has me wondering, are we targeted? Are our missions under attack? Why should we now have to suddenly pay more security. Certain countries who may be in, at war, like Russia, may have to do that if, they, if there's, a, there's a set of persons against them who may go on be uh, outside their embassies causing problems. But Trinidad and Tobago, to me, is a friendly country. I mean, what is, what is the need? And this is where I may need some clarity why there's a need. Now, 
Washington, with what went on in the American elections um, um, recently, if you have a, a, a mission there, you may need to protect it more in case there's any spillover. But I, the targeting of the mission is what I want. Are we targeted to justify that those um, persons who are there as ambassadors and staff need extra security? And this is where I, um, um, I, 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 I you know, would like to get some clarity on that. Now, coming to another issue, the Minister of Finance stated that medical expenses and, uh, you know, they had a medical plan. So I'm trying to figure all that money went to medical plan. Is it, really, is it really feasible to pay all that money? But then I realized I pay a plan called Best Doctors for myself and my wife and my three kids. And it's almost 11000 a year we pay out to that plan. Complete plan. So therefore, the figures he quoted, when I try to calculate in my mind, if you have all the staff and, and the embassies, I think um, a fair plan really is to really help your personnel who are abroad. If you are working there and you, you fall ill, it's good to have that knowledge that you are being taken care of in a country. I mean, not all countries have the benefit of the free medical health care that we have. So our personnel there, I would congratulate the um, the you know the different missions for getting a plan, but I'm just hoping it's a plan that if we compare it, we can actually see it's a plan that is um, again appealing to the taxpayers that it's not overboard. But again, it's a good good idea that you are paying out um, to at least ensure that if your staff get ill, that there would be no sort of um, um, trauma in that that time into trying now hustle up to get a plan. So. What I may say is certain things had caused me a little concern in the explanation for transfers, but again, we are not allowed to speak on that today. But I am I'm hoping that um, with the fact, with the um, input of this, that at least we can continue the NP and UNIPET um, going as, as they have been going and, and, and at least um, g giving us some sort of benefit. And I'm thinking that with the you missions abroad, whatever money spent, again, I would like some more tra transparency. But on the average, I think if the government has to ensure that their staff is safe, their buildings are safe, they need to do it. But the population and the taxpayers need to just scrutinize it more to prevent any old talk after. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Smith. Mr. President, um, let me first give my congratulations to you uh, on your new appointment. Thank you once again. I want to begin my contribution by expressing great thanks and appreciation for an opportunity once again to grace these halls that have been a symbol of our democracy for so many years. And of course, present on behalf of my learned colleagues and brothers in arms in this honorable Senate a second time. I'm mindful that it is not a light accommodation when one is given the opportunity to serve in this capacity as a service called upon is not for product or service provision in the capitalist sense, but the greatest type of service that we can aspire to engage in that of human service. And so, comrades and colleagues, it is not lost on me 
the unique and rare privilege to lay words and share thoughts for discussion and discourse about matters that will no doubt have an indelible mark on the lives of so many of our nation's citizens, presently and in the future. Whether they are conscious of this representation on behalf of them. And so, Mr. President, following my colleagues' part to uncover elements of this bill, I will make attempts to represent the interests of the people of Trinidad and Tobago with the highest levels of intellect and grace. Now to the meat of the matter. And the matter for consideration today is the supplementary appropriation for fiscal year 2022 in the sum of $815,567,165. And as we all are aware, it was necessary to have this supplementary appropriation of the said sum to retire two advances from Treasury deposits in order to bring to account expenditure under the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries in the amount of 800 million, and also to bring account expenditure incurred under the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs in the sum of 15 plus million dollars. And I want to begin my analysis of the above by impressing upon this Honorable Senate the following which will have relevance as I advance my contribution, but for now permit me to use the words of Adam Smith, widely considered the father of economics, because of his theories on capitalism, free markets, and supply and demand. No doubt entrenched in these concepts are elements of country management, which this bill speaks to directly. And the success of such management re made relevant by these appropriations. And if I were to gather the words of the book Wealth of Nations, it says, and I quote, no society can surely be flourishing and happy. And notice the words I'm saying, flourishing and happy, of which the greater part of the members are poor and miserable. It is but equity besides that, who, that they who feed, clothe, and lodge the whole body of the people should have such a share of the produce of their own labor as to be themselves tolerably well-fed, clothed, and lodged. And one might think, or be moved to think, that this 800 plus million dollars being deliberated here is merely an accounting exercise. And sadly, in many respects, this holds truth. But the nature of accounts provide that an aggregate number must have a derived position. And therefore, though we are being given the opportunity to, con to consume the meal after the fact, we must also consider the ingredients of that meal. And to go a bit further, Mr. President, these are not supplementations that, can that we can simply gloss over without proper scrutinization and examination. It is important for us, not only for our own right, the pursuance of these matters, but because it is incumbent on us to examine, shed light, and to bring bear the real material impact and understanding of what these appropriations mean, not only for those who bear the burden of tax, but also as a means of helping those of the working class understand and appreciate where their share in the burden of taxation goes. And might I say, these considerations are from the sweat and the blood of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, we cannot allow ourselves to simply gloss over such a large sum that comes from the public 
pockets. You see, it is not sufficient to say we require 800 plus million dollars, but we must understand that each member of society requires us as stewards of the investment via their labor to give proper account of the where, the when, the how, and the why. It is not sufficient, Mr. President, to treat with these sums requested summarily and to generalize and to make insignificant what is in fact significant in this regard. And some would have us, and I say so some on the other side, because where they say to us, nothing is behind these numbers. Nothing is here to see, gentlemen and gentlewomen. It is then we must adequately comb through the details, lest we find ourselves in agreement to things that we never agreed to. And so I want to take this time and I want to take these items laid before us with great reverence and not passing the matter in frivolity. So, Mr. President, let us examine the real material impact of this money and what exactly the Honorable Minister of Finance hastily is requesting we as a nation sign off on. The sum is not a small sum. But let us consider the first element which relates to the fuel subsidy. And as discussed in the Standing Committee, and I'm quoting here from those facts stated, the Honorable Minister Young was quoted as saying, the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries has a mandate to manage the fuel subsidy that has been provided to the people of Trinidad and Tobago for many years, along with consultation with the Ministry of Finance. And that is what this whole movement of the $800 million is about. And might I say, that was said in quite a callous, dismissive way, but we move on. Further details of the $800 million suggested that two payments were made on the 29th of July 2022, and the second payment on September 2022. Further queries by my learned colleagues revealed that there was a separation of these payments, 500 million in July, and then an additional 300 million in September. The total subsidy paid for fuel for fiscal 2022 was a total of 1.67 billion. And the importance of this is such. One, the public should note that this payment was below what the government expected to pay in fiscal 2022. In fact, a statement by the Honorable Minister Colum Inbert on April 8th Speaking to the adjustment to fuel prices, he said, and I quote, there are many competing demands for scarce resources in Trinidad and Tobago at this time. And the government is of the view that it is not productive, equitable, or prudent to spend an unbudgeted $1.69 billion or $1.47 billion more than planned. Subsidizing fuel this money could be far better utilized in the social services sector, in the health sector, in our capital development programs, on VAT refunds, on cleaning off unpaid bills owed to contractors, etc., etc. And the minister goes on to say, however, the government is cognizant of the effect of an increase in the price of fuel on consumers, notwithstanding the fact that fuel, a fuel subsidy is a regressive measure, and this gives an indication, Mr. President, to the thinking of the honorable members across the table. Accordingly, the government is of the view that the liability for any fuel price adjustment should be shared more or less equally. And what they're saying here is that the public should take ownership of these costs. And that has been the history 
of this government in terms of passing on these costs to the public. And it is relevant, Mr. President, because we're asking the public to take $800 million plus dollars out of the consolidated fund, and as my colleague would have indicated, done so like a thief in the night. Nevertheless, nevertheless. So, Senator, you just want to, when you're making your contributions, be very careful of the phrases that you're using, lest you run into the standing order that speaks to the imputation of improper motives. Continue, but continue carefully in the choice of words that you're using. I'm guided, Mr. President. I will retract said statement and continue. And so the point that I'm trying to make is that the government, or honorable government, they are the ones who are suggesting a decrease in the subsidy values, and these values directly impact the consumer at the pump, and it is a historical fact that over successive periods, this has become a trend. And as the Honorable Minister of Health said, a trend is not made in one week. But this, my friends, has been a yearly trend. And so, based on observation of the facts, it is certainly something that we have to consider when embarking upon the scrutinization of this 800 plus million dollars. And the second point I wanted to make, Mr. President, this government for the last seven plus years has been laboring over the fact that they must pay this subsidy on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, while the Honorable Minister has consistently be aim been aiming, as I said, to remove subsidies for fuel, successive years. But when we look at the details, you were expecting in 2022 to spend $1.9 billion. You ended up spending $1.67 billion. But the most important point here is that the public is not seeing the material benefit that you are promising. In fact, in an article in the Trinidad Express on November 2nd, 2022, the Honorable Minister of Finance said, and I quote, I quote the article, Finance Minister Colum Inwood on Tuesday night promised benefits to the country from the government's 11 billion revenue windfall from 2022 fiscal year. Inwood said on Tuesday night that the government will be doing more with the money to benefit all of Trinidad and Tobago as he pledged support for the Ministry of Housing, low-cost projects, community projects, including social programs, grants, etc., etc. And he went on to say that the government has not had to borrow since December 2021 and said such services as the provision of housing was not cheap. You need a lot of money. Six one. I think we. It's, all this is irrelevant to the specific matters at, the, at hand. So, today. Senator, once again, as I did with Senator Mark when he was going a bit too deeply into comments made before, especially as it relates to the budget statement, between the budget statement and now. What is before us is very, very tight because it speaks to two things and two activities taking place. So I'm going to ask you to move on from the point that you're making and get back to what is before us, which is very specific. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, I'm guided. Like, like Christ, I am taking my cross up Calvary Hill, and if you would allow it, once I reach to the top, it will be finished. But thank you again, I'm guided by you and your, your wisdom in dealing with these matters. And the point that I'm trying to, to make um, and to emphasize is that we, the public, must understand the means by which the government is dipping into our pockets. And so when we come to the accounting of the people's money, not the government's money, 
we must look at the circumstantial evidence and the context of which this money is taken, whether it be lawful or not. And my colleague, Senator Mark, he mentioned that yes, it is legal to do so, and it is allowable to do so, but many things in life are allowable, but they also are necessary. And so I just want for the benefit of the public to highlight that some things, some practices, some policies being pursued by those on the other side are in fact lawful, but are unnecessary. And the, the, the real material impact is that they don't redound to the benefit of the man on the ground. The taxi man that has to now go by the pump and pay his portion in terms of fuel, etc. And this is a critical and important fact. And yes, elements of relevance is important, but we must dive in to the context by which this $800 million is being requested from the public. And continuing, Mr. President, so we have a situation where the government is using this $800 million allocation via transfer for a subsidy which, as I mentioned before, is much less than forecasted. And a subsidy whose nature is to benefit the people. But for the public and for those who may not know, subsidies are quite ticklish. And they are direct and indirect subsidies. And I want to just give a brief definition for the public's benefit. What exactly is the subsidy that we're engaging in? And if I were to Quote from the economics text, direct subsidies are those that involve an actual payment of funds towards a particular individual group or industry. Indirect subsidies are those that do not hold a predetermined monetary value or involve actual cash outlays. They can, in they can include... Order. Order. One, uh, going into a lot of detail about policy and subsidy, and this is not what we're debating here today. So, Senator, the point of order is upheld. There's really no need to go into what a subsidy is. Like I said, the bill is very specific. It asks for a certain thing to happen. The Minister of Finance would have spoken to some of the reasons for such. Other senators would have spoken in rebuttal of such. And I'm asking you to focus on what is before us. You do not need to go too deeply into things like explanation of what a subsidy is, it is going to put you outside of the realm of relevance. Continue. Mr. President, again, I'm guided. The only reason I'm touching on these elements is because, as you know, there's a public viewing, and the public may not be aware of these sort of technical terms. And so for the benefit of them, I want to express. That is why, express. Senator, there are rules within the chamber which all senators must follow. And what you're doing in relation to what I've asked you to move on from will put you outside of those rules, irrespective of the fact that there's a public viewing. So I would ask you to move on from that point. If you have any other new points to bring forward, I invite you to do so now. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, I'm guided by your wisdom, and I will continue, all right, in a more strict and direct manner. So in looking at the, the material and in looking at Again, this quite exorbitant sum, this appropriation, I was curious to see whether or not other countries like Trinidad have had the benefit of these subsidized items because this is what we're using the 800 million for, yes? And so in doing so, my research reflected in fact, when looking at ECLAC, and they did a study on petroleum product pricing, et cetera, in 65 developing countries, which we are one of, and I quote from that particular article, all countries have been affected by sharply rising oil prices on the world market in the past decade. In real terms, after adjusting for local inflation and converting to local currency, the annual wood prices of gasoline have almost doubled 
across 160 countries. Now, further down it speaks to, as petroleum product prices soar, many governments came under pikes. According to a recent survey of the pricing policy for gasoline, diesel, kerosene, and cooking gas in 65 developing countries, two-thirds have kept domestic prices below market-based levels. And one or more fuel in the past three years subsidizing again consumers. Two-fifths have frozen retail prices of gasoline, diesel, or both for the months, even years ahead. And the reason I'm making this point is because whether or not we have achieved, we have forecasted $1.9 billion, and we've actually, the actual item becomes $1.67 billion, under this government, whether we perform well or not, the result is the same for the public a negative benefit. And even when there's room or allowance, we are constantly hearing cries of doom and gloom as though we are not partakers in our own natural abundance. And it seems to me that this is a mentality of a backward thinking government. And if I were to look at just the other day, a couple of days ago, when we're looking at what was called the bumpy road ahead, our Honorable Prime Minister again, even though on the backdrop of this relative savings, comes to the public and says, I don't want you for a minute to believe that this is going to be plain sailing in TNT. There are difficult times ahead. Sorry. Uh, Senator, so once again, you are outside of the boundaries of relevance. I'm going to have to caution you for the last time. This is very, very specific. There is no need to go into a wider explanation of subsidies and the benefits thereof, because it will fall you, it would it would ensure that you're outside of the boundaries of relevance. In a budget debate, which occurs at a particular point in time, that's where you would get the wide berth in relation to what you're saying. This is extremely specific. So I ask you at this point that if you have any points in relation to what the bill is asking to do, bring them forward now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And so if, if I were to consider the comments again made in this chamber, and the Honorable Minister would have mentioned, and this is why I'm speaking to the benefit and lack of benefit to the public based on the changes as it relates to monies that we have received via revenue and expenditure as the minister rightly said in his contribution today, he said that revenue came in the amount of 54 billion, that's revenue. And he said that, so I believe I can elaborate here. And in terms of expenditure, he spoke to 53.1 billion. And so we've experienced a 1 billion plus, as, I, as the minister rightly said, a surplus. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because this appropriation is the government coming to the public and saying, even though we've had this surplus, and even though this money has been allocated, we need to gather this money to again provide benefit via UNIPET, via NPMC, Natural Petroleum, the marketing company, these payments, and again, as the minister would have outlined, these payments go to those entities and then pass to PARIA, and then a level of arbitrage occurs by which the public then pays its share. And so when I look at the general and then the specific, it seems to me, Mr. President, 
than, that whether there is an uptrend or a downtrend, it matters not. And that is the only point I wanted to make. And in my view, when I look at the economics, to me, that seems as though, and this is, this is my phrase, it is an economics of nowhere. Because up or down, it matters not. But I will say no more on that. And Mr. President, I want us to consider this value given by the Honorable Minister in the context of our existing circumstance. Because it's important to critically analyze, again, that appropriation in context. And so we have a, an unemployment rate of around 4.5%. We have a labor force participation rate of around 54%. We have a business sector credit growth of around 12.2% and a consumer sector credit growth of about 2.9%. And the reason I speak to this, and this data can be taken from the Economic Bulletin 2022 of the Central Bank, is because when we look at our general government debt outstanding, Mr. President, point of order, 46-1, totally irrelevant. So, Senator Smith, I am attempting as best as I can to guide you in relation to this particular debate. You would understand that there are two clauses in this bill. And from what I've been hearing, you spent quite a number of time on clause one. And I have spent quite a number of time trying to get you to stay within the boundaries of relevance. Under normal circumstances, you would have moved on to clause two to speak to any new points that you may have on that. I will give the final warning this time because you're far advanced in your contribution that I'm not going to raise on relevance again in relation to the contribution thus far, as best as you can, stay within the boundaries of relevance. There's no need to talk about economics or broaden the scope of the debate. Thank you for your guidance. Again, I don't want to, to labor this Honorable House. I only mention it again because the Honorable Minister would have itemized and highlighted the surplus, and therefore I was treating um, with said surplus with a bit of analysis. And the second point is that, you know, for the benefit of the public, this is an $800 million plus bill, and quite frankly, there probably 800 million questions Mr. to be Vice asked President, as well. Mr. President, 53.1b, point of order. Tedious repetition. The continue, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And I, I want to continue on the note as it relates to head number 40, and I will guarantee the, the House, the, the good Senate, that I will move on in due time. So rest your legs. There's no need for you to, to stand. I will swiftly move on to the other relevant points, rest assured. But I want to give, you know, context, and I want to, to speak to, you know, Warren Buffett, who said, and I quote, in the long run, management stressing appearance over economic substance. Um, Mr. Sorry. Senator, <laughs> on a point of relevance, can you kindly stick to the topics at hand? You continue to quote way beyond what is needed today. I'm guided, Mr. Vice President. You know, I'm very careful in, in, now I have to be very careful in the things that I see and don't see. It seems to be a, quite a wave of opposition, no pun intended, um, with the contributions that I'm making. 
Nevertheless, I will aspire to continue. May I ask, Mr. Vice, Pre Mr. Vice President, how much more time do I have? Senator, your official time ends at 4.40. However, I may curtail it based upon, Senator Mark, based upon your persistent irrelevance on many matters. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Again, I, I note the, the concern, and it is only because I'm a public servant in this regard that I want to deal and treat with matters pertaining to the public pockets, of which, whether or not curtailed or otherwise, eventually, when the bell rings and the tower falls, the public is who decides that. But nevertheless, let us move on before I wax biblical on this, on this Senate. I will continue to the other items as listed here that may be more comfortable for those on, on the other side. And so if we look at head 65, Mr. Vice President, I have now reached the mark where comfort can be drawn, head 65. And it deals with the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. And we're dealing again with a sum that must come out of the taxpayers' pockets. And it is important for us to note that that is where this money is being derived. And at the end of the day, this is the place by which these items are discussed. And I believe I'm in the appropriate circumstance and setting to do so. And so with respect to sub-item 21, repairs and maintenance buildings, etc. I want to suggest to the ministers, etc., that in the case of the United States, this is a, a temperate country. And for those who might know what a temperate country is, it means there will be a level of winter. By definition, there are also mild to warm summers. But the cold winters, one can expect that there will be a level of storm. Now, the degree and the nature of those storms, obviously we cannot predict, and unfortunately we do not have the foresight of God the Father. But in contemplating this particular head, I said to myself, and I submit to the government, that when you plan for operations in countries that are temperate in nature, you can't expect the possibility of adverse weather conditions. And so sufficient and proper planning, operational planning, would have sufficiently forecasted any residual or variance or gap. And I would hope that a well-learned, established, seven plus year in office government would have had this well thought out, well planned, an executional arm with great operational efficiency. And so it perplexed me when I looked at the head item that these massive appropriations were being considered. Suffice it to say that though they are acts of God. Senator, you have five minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. That though they are acts of God, there's also acts of management. And proper management would have easily dealt with these appropriations. 
Now, I will move on again to the other item, which is sub-item 50, housing and accommodation. And safe to say, again, proper management comes to mind here. I would like to understand what, if any, is the usual provision for existing funding of related services of the residents of the ambassador, as well as the details of the security services, and who, in fact, may have benefited from contracts related to upgrades and arrangements. Because we have, again, an aggregate figure. I know the minister would have made attempts to give us more detail, but still there's a question of procurement and process. And whom on our end, in our sovereign nation of Trinidad and Tobago, is vetting that process? And what is the details of that vetting process? And so maybe in the wind up, the honorable ministers, etc., can give greater clarification, as my learned colleague, Senator Mark said, shed more light on these matters. Yeah. And I really do appreciate that you're close to the end, but 46-1, this is not a debate on policy matters, and therefore the discussion should be confined to the points raised by the Honourable Minister of Finance. Standing order upheld. Senator Mark, kindly I'll allow your colleague to finish as well. Mr. Vice President, again, I, I, I won't labour the Senate Further, and I will make attempts now to wrap my contribution to this very honorable Senate. And so, comrades, we started here with a bill that at first glance may be considered to many a simple, cosmetic, and administrative item, but in reality, all bills brought to this Honorable Senate have great value to the democratic process. The government would have us dismiss, pass over these matters, but we are here to reveal the truth behind these policies, actions taken as an affront to the people of this great nation. And so I will end my contribution with a quote by Henry Clay, and it says, the government is a trust, a trust, and the officers of the government are trustees. And both the trust and the trustees are created for the benefit of who, you might ask, Mr. Vice President. And the resounding answer by Henry Clay would be, of the people. I thank you for your indulgence, and I bid you a good day. Senator Dionarine. <clears throat> Senator Mark, your level of crosstalk is really disturbing the mood of the chamber, right? And even if it is you have to do so, kindly address the members on the other side by the proper title, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President for the opportunity to contribute to this debate on an act to provide for further supplementary appropriation for the financial year ending 30th of September 2022. Mr. Vice President, my contribution today will be very brief. I will, con I will comment on two matters. 
at hand, one, the advances made to fulfill the fuel subsidy expenditure, and very briefly, I would say a few words on the fiscal outturn as mentioned by the Minister of Finance. So the bill before us is seeking authorization for a sum of 815 million to be issued from the consolidated fund to fulfill a liability that was incurred in fiscal 2022 of $815 million via advances from Treasury deposits in accordance with 17, Section 171B of the Exchequer and Audit Act. These advances were used to fulfill expenditure under two heads. That, that is one, under the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs of $15 million which I will not be getting into, and the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries to meet the shortfall in fuel subsidy of 800 million um, to NP and Unipet. Now, this is where I would want to focus my contribution on, Mr. Vice President. Um, so, this further supplementation of 800 million to head 40 under Ministry of Energy and Energy and and Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. It may appear undebatable as it was a mandatory expense made in the public's interest. But Mr. Vice President, I would like to respectfully question the justification provided by the Minister of Finance on the need for these advances from the Treasury deposits. Now, even though the option of taking advances from Treasury deposits is available to meet expenditure in the public's interest, according to the Exchequer and Audit Act, I am not convinced it warranted advances being made from Treasury deposits. From my understanding, there was ample information available to the government via estimates from Budgets Division through the statement made by the Minister of Finance on April 8, 2022, um, prior, to the, prior to the supplement supplementation being requested in the mid-year review. That was when um, 300 million in supplementation was required for the shortfall of subsidy under the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries. When the Minister of Finance made his statement in the, in the House of Representatives in April, the public was made aware that with the adjustments of prices at the pump and application of the petroleum production levy, the government will still be required to cover approximately 840 million in 2022 to subsidize fuel. Then we came on May 15th 2022, during the mid-year review, where a supplementation of 300 million was requested. This was after statements were made, giving a clear picture on how much the fuel subsidy was expected to cost for the rest of the fiscal year. So I ask, why the supplementation was not requested then, during the mid-year review? Mr. Vice President, by May 2022, we would have seen five months of consecutive increases in the price of oil. At that point, the price of oil averaged at approximately $90.08 per barrel, US $90.08. Cents, US $90.08. Cents. And the government increased prices at the pump based on their estimates that the price of oil will average at US $95 per barrel for the rest of the year. And as a matter of fact, if we are looking at external estimates projections for the price of oil from that point, April and May, in April, the IMF World Economic Outlook, together with other international agencies, were forecasting the price of oil to be over $100 per barrel for the rest of the year. So, Mr. Vice President, with this information available to the government, I'm trying to understand why we chose to resort to advances from the Treasury deposits rather than just requesting it, um, requesting the supplementation at the mid-year review. Now, 
According to the Minister of Finance, this supplementation brings the total fuel subsidy incurred for fiscal 2022 to $2.49 billion, that is on an accrual basis, uh, but $1.67 billion on a cash basis because the government's accounting and budget system is done on a cash basis. But again, for me, the numbers are simply not adding up based on information that I have available to me. So again, I'm humbly seeking clarification from the Minister of Finance. The details available to me presents that in the draft estimates for fiscal 2022, it included an allocation, an initial allocation of $20 million. That was when the budget was initially read and the price of oil was estimated at US $65 a barrel. Then during the mid-year review, a supplementation was provided for $300 million. The statement was made in April, as I already mentioned, explaining that if the prices are not adjusted at the pumps and the population offers to share, and the population shares the burden of the exponential increase in prices, then the subsidy would be estimated, if it would be estimated at $2.12 billion. That is if the prices at the pump were not, pumps were not increased. Then following the application of the production, the petroleum production levy, um, the subsidy was estimated at $1.6 billion. With the increase in the prices at the pumps, the estimated cost to be borne by the government should have been $840 million for fiscal 2022. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm not too sure how we arrived at the $2.49 billion, Mr. Vice President, um, total on an accrual basis for the cost of the fuel subsidy. Um, perhaps the Minister of Finance could shed some light. Maybe this figure includes um, the production, the petroleum production levy, together with what um, would have been, what it would have cost by um, removing the subsidy. I am not sure, so I am seeking clarification. Uh, there are two areas as well, two additional areas that I would like to see clarification on this $2.49 billion. Um, it, it will be interesting to know what was the final um, amount taken, taken care by the petroleum production levy collected from, collected from oil companies that contributed to the payment of the fuel subsidy. I think um, initially, the Minister of Finance would have estimated it at $436 million. That would have been based on an average oil price of um, $95 a barrel. So some final figures there, because we are here closing the accounting period for fiscal 2022, and it would be interesting to hear some of these figures. Now quickly, I move on to the fiscal outturn, Mr. Vice President, and yes, I agree. It is a significant achievement to record a surplus of $1.08 billion on the books for the first time since fiscal 2009 and 2010. A small surplus of $188 million was, reco was recorded then. Prior to that, we had five consecutive years of overall surpluses recorded between fiscal, 2020 fiscal 2003 and 2008. So, the, so yes, the books have balanced and is in surplus for fiscal 2022. But Mr. Vice President, from a fiscal sustainability, sustainability point of view, this may be largely temporary as it is a derivative of energy windfalls. Sustaining surpluses continues to be dependent on higher energy prices. If I recall correctly, when I would have spoken during the appropriation bill in 2022, I cautioned the Minister of Finance on his optimism of attaining a surplus in fiscal 2023, indicating that it would only be possible if we um, earn additional revenue in the vicinity of around $9 billion, which could only be possible from a large energy windfall. Thankfully, we ended up um, earning 
billion in additional revenue in a year we expected to record nine billion in deficit. Um, this is the outcome of an upside scenario that is largely externally driven and derived primarily, primarily as a result of exponential increases in energy prices, which has pillovers to the prices of, of petrochemicals, which belongs to the downstream sector, downstream energy sector, which we are a significant exporter of as well. Um, so while we celebrate this surplus, we need to be cognizant of the fact that we have been recording um, non-energy fiscal deficits in the vicinity of around $23 billion on an annual basis. This is according to central bank data. And I, I would like to ask the Minister of Finance if he, if he has the information available to present this honorable house and the public with the non-energy fiscal balance recorded for fiscal 2022. We have to remember, Mr. Vice President, that growth performance has historically and continues to be characterized by a high degree of volatility, influenced um, largely by fluctuations in energy prices. It has been influenced largely by external condi conditions, particularly energy prices, and by the growth performance of our major trading partners. So my final point has to do with the unpredictability of the increasingly volatile global environment in which we are operating in as a small open economy. Mr. Vice President, increasing volatility of external conditions is becoming a norm all over the world and all over the world and it is a factor that many governments, all governments have to take into consideration uh, with higher levels of prob probability going forward. And it, it is the main factor we must take into consideration when arriving at our forecast. As a result, the Ministry of Finance, the, the team at the Ministry of Finance, the team of forecasters need to be extra vigilant in monitoring the global events in which we operate in and how it influences energy prices because we are experiencing extreme volatility with energy prices um, together with other commodity prices. As it is becoming ever more important now than, the, now, now, more now than before for estimating not only our budget revenues but the way in which we craft our public policy and we know how to implement our, uh, our public policy and allocate our expenditures accordingly. With those few words, Mr. Vice President, I thank you. Senator Jayanti Lashmiya. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I promise to be very, very brief in my contribution. Mr. Vice President, this bill may be two clauses long, but it represents $815 million of taxpayers' money. And it is money that the taxpayer is now ask, being asked to pay more at the fuel pump, and so I believe that questions ought to be posed in a civilized manner, but simply to get answers on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago who have to pay these bills. Mr. Vice President, I want to focus only on the allocation or the additional expenditure brought to account under Head 65, the Ministry of Foreign and CARICOM Affairs. I think Senator Dial Singh touched a little bit on this matter, and I will try my best not to be repetitive, but 
Apart from the issues of management and so on of our buildings, Mr. Vice President, I simply want to ask the question about the authorization of the expenditure. Because we are seeing some 15 million additional dollars being spent, in addition to our large sums of money being allocated to our overseas missions. And I believe it raises questions, because money simply cannot be spent for things which weren't anticipated and then occurred, and I'm not saying they didn't occur and the occasion did not arise for um, issues to be addressed, like damage to buildings and, and so on. But what is the process by which we go through authorizing these expenditures? Because these are not simple, routine, day-to-day -day things. Um, although some of the explanations given relate to significant increases in operational costs, inclusive of parking spaces. I don't know exactly what that means of operational costs, what other costs apart from parking and so on would be <clears throat> captured. But Mr. Vice President, when we are authorizing these payments, when we are authorizing repairs and maintenance to our overseas missions and the residences, what is the process of procuring contractors? Is it some sort of soul select type of, of tendering that happens? Do we go by some three-code system to provide how we do goods and services in the ministries here? And is there a proper process of procurement when it comes to managing the overseas mission? So that's one thing. The second thing is that what is the system by which the works being carried out, the additional uh, matters which are raised that result in this additional expenditure, what is the verification system? What is the check and balance? I know, for example, when uh, work is carried out, I, rec I think I recall from ministries and so on, when works are carried out at public buildings in Trinidad, that you have um, persons from the Ministry of Works and Transport who would visit and verify and engineer and architect and all sorts of um, you know, professionals who are based at that ministry who would visit and conduct verification and you know all the project management stuff and make sure the scope of works was adhered to and all of those things. Who, and I'm asking, and if it was done, I, I would be happy if the details would be provided. But Mr. Vice President, it is important on these bills, as simple and basic as they seem, when they represent this amount of money, that we pose these questions, if only to give the government an opportunity to answer and to tell the population. And that is all we are here to ask. So is there a proper process of verification being done when it is additional expenditure to this, to the tune of $15 million is being, um, it, when expenditure to that, that tune is being incurred by our foreign overseas missions? And finally, and as I said, I will be very brief. I would like to raise the issue of the inspector of missions because a lot of what I spoke about before is I, uh, you know, are things which I believe fall under the purview of the inspector of missions. Particularly if you have issues being raised um, at the different missions, which I think they are supposed to visit regularly. Those it could serve it, the, the the purpose of that post holder is twofold. One. Problems could be detected beforehand, and that goes to the management issues that speakers before me would have spoken about. So we might be able to better manage, like we know the pipes are a little old, so we don't wait until a winter storm come for them to get damaged and we have to replace them. I think anybody who ever lived in a temperate country knows that you have to maintain your, your water lines and so on before the winter. But those little things could be picked up by the inspector of missions, but he is also, he or she could also be the check and balance on what is taking place and the expenditure and so on. And I recall that in 20, I think it was 2018 or so, 2017 or 18, but it was under this administration that one of their appointed diplomats resigned because he raised a concern about excessive expenditure at an overseas mission. And he asked the prime minister to respond and there was no response forthcoming. And um, you know, he eventually tendered his resignation and it was accepted. And I do recall as well that the former, um, a former uh, diplomat himself and the head of the public service, Mr. Dumas, he came out in the public and he said very, very 
firmly that it was necessary to have the post of inspector of missions, as costly as it might be to go and visit missions all over the world, that post holder was very, um, served a very important um, function because they could find out you know, what is happening there, have discussions with the staff. You don't just depend on the, on the uh, diplomat, the appointed um, person themselves, whether it's the consular general or the, or the um, high commissioner, but they have discussions with the staff and they find out what is happening. So it was raised in the other place and I did not hear a response and I simply made a note of it and I just realized no one else raised it today and I would simply like to ask the question, although I see the minister of Foreign Affairs isn't here today. Um, hopefully the Minister of Finance can tell us whether that post has been filled, whether it will, if it's not, whether it will be filled in due course. And, you know, tell us if it is that anybody is actually performing those functions right now of checking in with our missions as a means of, you know, perhaps curtailing the expenditure from going over what is budgeted, even though some things we cannot predict, but having a better management of expenditure at our overseas missions, and also perhaps detecting problems and nipping them in the bud a little bit before they arise. I would also look forward to getting some details just for my own knowledge and perhaps the knowledge of other people in the country as to how we go about procuring services at our overseas missions in the most cost-effective way to make sure we are getting value for money for the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago who are being asked to spend this 15 million additional dollars here today. Mr. Vice President, with those few words, I thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President. I listened carefully to points made. Points have been made by Senator Mark, Senator Dial Singh, Senator Diona Ryan. The only point made by Senator Mark that I think warrants a response is to deal with the Honorable Senator's complaint that I did not post on social media about the use of Treasury deposits for the payment of the fuel subsidy. But unfortunately, Senator Mark said I should have twitted. And I looked in the def dictionary for a definition of twitted, or an act of twitting. And I found that a twit is a silly or annoying person. I think what Senator Mark really meant was not that was that he meant I should have tweeted, which is a post made on a social media application called Twitter. So I don't tweet, Mr. Vice President. I also don't like to associate with tweets. So that is all I have to say about what Senator Mark said, because what I've noticed with Senator Mark, as I was telling my colleagues, it appears to me at least that when the goodly senator is telling you good morning, hello, have a nice day, or he's screaming at you about some contribution that you made, it all appears to be the same. So that's all I have to say about Senator Mark. His entire contribution was wholly irrelevant. With respect to Senator Dial Singh, there were some questions about the policy that is utilized by overseas missions and the approach in terms of dealing with matters like 
building maintenance, repairs, insurance, medical expenses, security, etc. And I want to put into the record some facts. I am reading now from a article published in August of 2022, and this was published on CNBC in the United States, and the article is entitled, As Climate Change Threatens More Homes, Some Properties Are Getting Too Costly to Insure. And this article went on to speak about the fact that over the 12-month 12 12 period, August 2021 to August 2022, homeowner insurance premiums rose by 12.1% in the United States. And that's just on average. But the increases in insurance premium costs for buildings and homes and so on was significantly higher in disaster-prone states in the United States. And that is in the period under review. And I would also like to refer to some other um, stories, articles. I go now to PBS, and the article is in January of 2022, in the height of the winter of 2022. And this article's headline is 2021's deadliest, coldest, most expensive U.S. disasters by the numbers. And it goes on to say the following. In yet another year of extremes, the United States in 2021, and we are looking at fiscal 2022, which goes from October 21 to September 22, the United States faced the second highest number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters on record. And they would have been keeping records for 100 years. So what we are being told that in this fiscal year, where we have had to send money to overseas missions to deal with severe damage caused by completely unprecedented winter storms, that in that year, it was the second highest number of billion dollar weather and climate disasters on record in the United States. And in this fiscal year that we are looking at, the United States suffers the largest number of disaster related deaths in a decade. And this is from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So tropical cyclones racked up the highest cost adding to a total of $78 billion in damage in 2021. So the fact of the matter is that fiscal 2022, the period between October 2021 and 2022, was an extremely bad year. Impossible to predict. When estimates are being prepared, for a fiscal year, one looks at averages so that the budget division would have looked at the impact of damage of winter storms or other storms, hurricane, flood, whatever, and would have put a provision for repairs and emergency repairs to buildings and facilities in our overseas missions. But the budget division, nor could I ever predict that that winter would have been the second worst winter on record in the United States in 100 years. So I think people need to understand that. It's easy to talk, you know. It's easy to say that people should plan, but one cannot plan for something like this. You have to use averaging. In addition, when one looks, so that is the whole question of why this money was necessary. And it was necessary to send it. And no inspector of missions will know that in 
December 2021 or January 2022, you're going to get the deadliest storm in the United States, the second deadliest series of storms in 100 years. Nobody would know that. So nobody can cater for that. Yeah. There would be an appropriate appropriation, and there was $5 million, and that was thought based on averages and based on previous trends and based on expenditure for the last 10 years. That $5 million would have been deemed to be appropriate and quite responsible too. So these, these things happen. Look at our own country. Look at the situation that we faced in the last couple of months in terms of devastating floods. These are not things that one can predict. One can provide, but one cannot predict. As I said in the other place, we are not seamen. And so that is the whole question of the damage to the buildings caused by those unprecedented winter storms. Impossible to predict. And I have another article dealing with the February 2022, because it didn't end in December 21 or January 21. It went into February 2022. And the February 2022 North American winter storm affected a wide swathe of much of the United States, spread from Texas all the way to Maine. 19 states in the United States were impacted by that February 2022 North American winter storm. More than 90 million people were affected. And when one looks at the coverage with respect to that February 2022 North American winter storm, that was also one of the deadliest on record. So I am sorry. I cannot agree that any inspector of missions or any public servant for that matter would be able to predict that in fiscal 2022, you had some of the deadliest winter storms on record. One can only go on historical trends and on averages for a significant period, say for 10 years. The other thing I would like to point to if one goes into the literature as well, when one looks at the whole question of the cost of private security, because I made the point that there was a significant increase in the cost of private security services in all the capitals of the world that our missions are in. And that occurred in fiscal 2022. And if one goes again into the literature, you will see that there is a significant increase in security costs all over the world in 2022, fiscal 2022, for all sorts of reasons. Tensions, turmoil, protests, people becoming more radical, diplomats being put under pressure, subjected to new and emerging threats. And this is just a fact of life. So that again, when one goes into the literature, one will see there was a significant, unprecedented increase in the cost of private security all over the world. The cost of personal security, in fact, is increasing all over the world. And they expect that the cost is going to increase at an average of in excess of 5% every year for the next several years. Moving now to health care, I would like to draw Senator's attention to an article entitled Eight Reasons for Rising Health Care Costs, published in July of 2022. And According to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in 2021, healthcare costs in the United States skyrocketed to $4.3 trillion. And the increase across the board in healthcare costs in the United States in fiscal 2022 was almost 10%. And this, again, is a worldwide phenomenon. Worldwide, coming out of COVID, healthcare costs have increased exponentially all over the world. And again, no public servant can anticipate that medical plans are going to increase by 20% in any given fiscal year. Again, one has to go on averages, one has to go on historical trends, and you have to remember we're coming out of COVID. This is a completely unpredictable period. If I draw a parallel, Mr. President, 
Look at the cost of transportation. Look at the cost of a container coming out of China. The cost of a container from China to Trinidad and Tobago, pre-COVID, might have been $2,000. In the middle of COVID, it was $20,000, a 1,000% increase. So you've had all sorts of issues with respect to rising costs in, in healthcare, supply chain problems, the, the, the diversion of focus towards dealing with the global pandemic and so on. And the, the, the evidence is there. Significant increases across the world. I'll, I'll give you another article. Global healthcare benefit costs projected to jump by 10% in 2023, coming to this particular year. And this article was published in London in October of 2022. So widespread inflation, and we must realize we're living in the real world. I mean, when you go in the supermarket, etc., you see the, the impact of global inflation. And global inflation is not confined just to the cost of building materials, or the cost of transportation, or the cost of food, but it is also driving global healthcare costs to the highest level. This is what this article is telling us. In nearly 15 years, according to a survey of global medical insurers, conducted by the WTW. So, as I said, it's easy to talk, but when you have to deal with a problem, these are the realities that we have to deal with. So it's impossible to plan in a situation like that, when healthcare costs going up by 20%, security costs going up by 10%, insurance costs going up by 20%, and all because of unprinted, unprecedented global events. None of us can predict. And to deal with the whole question of prediction of oil prices, you know what I find? Slightly humorous sometimes. When, as Minister of Finance, I predict that based on the best intelligence information available, from the US Energy Information Administration, for example, from the World Bank, from the IMF, from Standard & Poor's, from McKinsey, and from all of the entities that would give you a forecast for oil prices in the coming year. And you would look at 10 different forecasts from reputable global forecasters. And you say, all right, you forecast your budget on $60 oil. And oil is 50, they say it's stupid. On the flip side, you forecast oil at 65, oil hit 120, they say it's still stupid. <laughs> so it's easy for people to talk, but we in this government, we don't operate by VAPs. Whenever we do a budget, we are very, very careful. And speaking for myself, I pay particular particular attention to the forecasts from the US Energy Information Administration. They are one of the most reliable in the world, but you also have energy organizations in the European Union. And we also consult with the institutions that we have relationships with, the IDB, the World Bank, the IMF, and all of the reputable institutions that give us a forecast for oil and gas prices. And having done that, we average them out, and we take account of various factors, and we come up with our estimates. We don't operate by VAPs. So I just wanted to put that on the record. And as I said, if your estimate is too high, you're a waste of time. If your estimate is too low, you're a waste of time. So I don't take on these things. We use science, and we speak to professionals. Now. Let me just explain, because Senator Durain did want to know why in the media review we only came and asked for supplementation of $300 million for the fuel subsidy. The reason was we had generated quite a significant surplus in the sale of petroleum products in previous years. 
And it was an expectation that in fiscal 2022, we would be able to bring that surplus to book because the petroleum marketing companies, NP and Unipet, the price at which they were selling the fuel at the gas station, a certain point in time, was higher than the price they were paying for it from Paria. And that is when oil prices, one may recall a particular year when oil prices went to zero. There was a particular day, I remember, when West Texas Intermediate dropped to zero and then went negative. And I mean, one has to try and wrap your mind around that. How on earth can an oil price become negative? But what was happening there is people just wanted to get the oil off their hands. So they were willing to pay people to take it away. And that's how it was negative. So in that particular COVID period, when oil price went to zero and then crept back up to say $10 and then slowly went up to 20 and 30. And in, in fact, Heritage Petroleum had to store oil until the price got back up to about $40. Because if they sold it at a price lower than say $35, they would be losing money on every barrel of oil because it was costing a little more than $30 a barrel or so to lift the oil. And when you add in other costs, say $35. So they had to wait until the price of oil went past 35. So they stored it, they kept it, and then they sold it when the price went up. So during that period, when oil was at $10, $20, $25, $30, etc., the price of fuel in Trinidad and Tobago would have been more than the price that Paria was paying for it. So the NP and Uniped generated a significant surplus. The surplus was in fact $500 million. And we had expected during fiscal 2022 to be able to apply that surplus to the fuel subsidy together with the 300 million that we appropriated. And at that time, we felt that that would have been adequate. Unfortunately, the price of LPG skyrocketed during the COVID period, 2020, 2021 into 2022. The price at which we have to buy LPG skyrocketed. And therefore, that $500 million, instead of being used for petroleum fuels, for motor fuels, for gasoline and diesel, we had to take that $500 million and use it to subsidize cooking gas. Because people need to understand that when we speak about the fuel subsidy, we don't just speak about subsidies on gasoline and diesel. We also need to look at subsidies on cooking gas. And the price of a 25 pound cylinder of cooking gas in Trinidad and Tobago is one tenth of the price it is in many other countries in the region, in the Latin American and Caribbean region. There's a huge subsidy on cooking gas that the government pays from its revenues, hundreds of millions of dollars. So that during that period, there was an exponential increase in the price of cooking gas because the, the, the gases that these things are made from, the, the, the various elements that come out of natural gas that are used in butane, propane, and all these things that are used to make the cooking gas, the price skyrocketed. So we, that $500 million in surplus that we thought we could have used for motor fuels, we then had to apply it to cooking gas. So that is the explanation, and I hope that that will answer the question asked by Senator Tordiederine. And with those few words, I beg to move, Mr. President. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled An Act to Provide for a Further Supplementary Appropriation for the Service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending the 30th of September 2022 be now read a second time. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled An Act to Provide for a Further Supplementary Appropriation for the Service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending 30th September 2022. <coughs> Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. President. 
In accordance with Standing Order 57-2, I beg to move that a bill entitled an act to provide for a further supplementary appropriation for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending 30th of September 2022 not be committed to a committee of the whole Senate. Honorable Senators, the question is that the bill entitled an act to provide for a further supplementary appropriation for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending the 30th of September 2022 not be committed to a committee of the whole Senate. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The bill will not be committed to a committee of the whole Senate. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. President. I beg to move that an act to provide for further supplementary appropriation for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending 30th of September 2022 be now read a third time and passed. Honorable Senators, the question is that a bill entitled an act to provide for a further supplementary appropriation for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending the 30th of September 2022 be now read a third time and passed. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. A bill entitled an act to provide for a further supplementary appropriation for the service of Trinidad and Tobago for the financial year ending 30th September 2022. Acting Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to move that this Senate to now adjourn to Tuesday, January 31st, 2023 at 1.30 p.m., which is Private Members' Day, and perhaps um, Senator Mark can give us some guidance as to which motion we would be debating on that. Senator often. Mark. Um, I would like, with your indulgence, to get back to the Honorable Minister um, by it in the morning to let her know what's the final position. So I will contact you at around 8 in the morning to let you know around 8. No, I can't tell you now. Honorable Senators, before I put the question on the adjournment, leave has been granted for two matters to be raised on the motion for the adjournment of the Senate. Senator Mark. President, it is almost approaching eight years since the government has been in office. And since this government arrived, the government has been tampering tinkering, amending the public procurement and disposal of public property act. Where today it has been completely watered down from its original status. Nevertheless, the Minister of Finance some time ago, brought regulations to effect this watered down piece of legislation. These regulations were passed, they were approved. And one was looking, one was looking forward to the government implementing and operationalizing the public procurement law. That was not to be. A new attorney general arrived on the compound of the government. And one would have thought that this new attorney general would have taken measures to give effect to this piece of legislation. But instead, this new attorney, attorney general, without being asked by the judiciary, 
wrote to the judiciary to get the judiciary response on its preparation for the implementation of the legislation. I do not know if that was a cue given by the Attorney General. And I say this advisedly. But an epistle of 29 pages emerged out of the judiciary. And all that the judiciary did not say was to scrap the public procurement and disposal of Public Property Act. And then the Attorney General told Trinidad and Tobago, in essence, the comments from the judiciary were literally traffic stopping. And Mr. President, the Attorney General was correct because any attempt to implement this law has come to a screeching stop. So the question that has to be asked is that whether this government has any intention of implementing and operationalizing the public procurement law or whether it has come to a screeching halt because of the statements issued by the judiciary. So today I have brought this motion to get from the government its position, its on the way forward. And may I say from the outset, that the United National Congress does not support these submissions made by the judiciary. In fact, the procurement regulator has adequately responded to, to many of the concerns laid and made by the judiciary. And the procurement regulator has asked that the act in its current form be implemented and operationalized. And as we go along, Mr. President, there will be kings in the armor, and we can adjust, we can amend, and we can bring changes. But let us proceed to implement the public procurement and disposal of property act. Now, Mr. President, I do not know. I think the Honorable Minister made a statement recently on the FIU. And I do not know if he understands the link between the statement he made and the inability of the government to implement and operationalize the public procurement law. I therefore would like to call on the Attorney General to indicate to Trinidad and Tobago what is the government's position on this very important piece of legislation. Is the government going to proceed to have it implemented? Or is the government going to delay because of comments made by the judiciary? We need to know. Because this, and Mr. Vi Mr. President, I just want to indicate to you that the judiciary was kind enough, according to information reaching me, to provide judges to the procurement regulator and regulation office to train the internal personnel back in 2019 and 20 to give effect to this piece of legislation. So the time for this kind of intervention, an attempt to delay the operationalization of this legislation 
this legislation rather, has passed. It has passed. And Mr. President, I don't know if the government understands the link between the lack of enforcement, implementation, and operationalization of this legislation, and the kind of activities taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. Senator, today. you have two more minutes. We have been told by the procurement regulator that Trinidad and Tobago loses some $5.3 billion on an annual basis since we have failed to implement that law. So in the last seven years, Mr. President, Trinidad and Tobago, through fraud and through embezzlement and bribery, may have lost about 35 to 40 billion dollars in revenues because of the lack of implementation. And look at the results facing our country. Murders is a total take. It, it, people are just under assault in this country. So Mr. President, in closing, I ask the Honorable Attorney General to tell Trinidad and Tobago where are we with the implementation and the operationalization of our public procurement and disposal of public property act. People need to know, and I'm here seeking answers from the government. And I hope the Attorney General would provide guidance on this matter as we go forward. I thank you very much, Mr. President. Attorney General. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and permit me the personal indulgence to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your ascension to a very significant constitutional office. My congratulations. Mr. President, I make the following statement with respect to the government's prioritization of the full proclamation of the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Act 2015, which I will refer to by the shorthand name, the Public Procurement Act. The Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, and this government have placed the highest priority on this important legislation. The government is fully committed to take the final steps to fully proclaim and to bring this legislation into operation. To this end, the government has adopted a coordinated and wholesome approach with the Office of the Attorney General and Ministry of Legal Affairs operating in tandem with the work led by several divisions of the Ministry of Finance, various other ministries, and the Office of the Procurement Regulator. <clears throat> Mr. President, permit me to provide a brief overview of the progression of the Public Procurement Act. The Public Procurement Act was amended three times, namely in 2016, 2017, and 2020. One, the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Amendment Act No. 5 of 2016. Two, the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Amendment Act No. 3 of 2017. And three, the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Amendment Act No. 27 of 2020. The most recent amendment in 2020 included exemption of services provided to public bodies or state-controlled enterprises. Mr. President, further to these amendments, there was the introduction of 10 public procurement regulations enacted by Parliament in February 2022. Quite notably, these pieces of legislation have collectively introduced additional material steps within the public procurement processes for public bodies, which in turn would require the government and the OPR and other key stakeholders to ensure that the requirements for full operationalization 
of the Public Procurement Act are comprehensively reviewed and the country made ready. The concerns raised by the judiciary, Mr. President, which were referred to in my statement laid in Parliament dated June 22, 2022, have since been made public by the judiciary. In, in this update, it is appropriate, however, without purporting to quote those concern, concerns, that they be listed. One, issues relating to the scope of the Act, including services which are exempt, such as funeral agencies, psychologists, and banks. Two, no separation of power. No, three, wide authority of the OPR. Four, insufficient assurance of due process. Five, issues of local content. Six, policies, reliance on policies with penalty for failure to adhere. Seven, power to assess and order damages. Eight, halting of the public body's procurement activity. Nine, framework and its adaptability to non-construction infrastructure type procurement. Ten, the real potential of the act to frustrate and hinder the functioning of the courts and other public bodies. Eleven, increases in costs to be borne by the state. Twelve, the judiciary being mindful of obligations as a public body, but procurement units remain unstaffed. Thirteen, the judiciary using proper procurement procedures, but additional requirements and attraction of mischief are real, of real potential concern. Fourteen, a great potential increase in public law litigation. Fifteen, increase in number of state attorneys available to support speedy hearings. Sixteen, small claims court with built-in mediation and agreements as to service. Seventeen, a reversion to an unmanageable workload of the court system in Trinidad and Tobago. Eighteen, circumvention of the provisions of the Mediation Act inclusive of standards and ethical standards. And nineteen, extensive effect on internal processes and operations and the need for dedicated legal focus. I, I repeat those concerns, Mr. President, simply to underscore the fact that they are concerns which have substance and ought not to be referred to in terms which are either pejorative or otherwise disrespectful of the judiciary. Mr. President, as part of this update, I am able to state that since my statement in Parliament on the 22nd of June 2022, along with legal officers of my ministry, I have met and engaged with the Office of the Procurement Regulator and his team. Further to that, at my invitation, this was followed up by the OPR writing to me on the 25th of August 2022, enclosing a package of documents. This package has been and continues to be under review by legal officers of my ministry. Mr. President, I bring to your attention that the legal officers of my ministry have been corresponding with other entities to ensure that there is robust engagement and cooperation among all stakeholders who play a key role in the implementation of the Act. In that process, we have examined and continue to examine the concerns raised by the judiciary, the OPR and others, so as to ensure that all issues are addressed for the full, responsible operationalization of the Public Procurement Act. By way of further update, my office has also prepared a draft proclamation schedule for the proclamation of the Public Procurement Act, which will be taken to the Cabinet in short order. Mr. President, I wish to end by stating that the Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago remains committed to the full proclamation of the Public Procurement Act and will continue to work assiduously and responsibly towards that goal in order to be prepared for the transition of public bodies to implement the law. Mr. President, I thank you. Senator Mark. Thank you, Mr. President, on my second matter, where I am seeking the government's consideration on looking at the possibility of capping further increases in fuel prices at the pump that would have negative impacts or effects on an already beleaguered population. I raise this issue, Mr. President, in the context of the price of oil 
being budgeted for 2023 fiscal year at $92.50, as well as the price of natural gas at $6 per MMBTU. So far, the forecast and the reality have not been promising. What we have witnessed is that according to information reaching our desk, and the minister can clarify these numbers, that the price of natural gas has been trading for about just under $3.60 on the international market. And we have seen a fluctuation of the price of crude oil from the 92.50 to some $80 per barrel. Now, Mr. President, if these figures turned out to be true, it means to say that the government's revenue projections could be under some challenge and threat. And the question that is being raised here is that we have had almost six consecutive increases in fuel prices at the pump. I think it may be five, it may be six, but I stand corrected. But the population cannot take any further increases in the price of fuel at the pump. Their backs are broken and they cannot take any further weight from the government. I also wish to inform this Honorable Senate that the government has choices available to it. And the Minister of Finance, two budget ago, statements ago, did indicate that the government was taking steps to liberalize and deregulate the fuel market so that when the price of crude oil is high, we pay the higher price. And when it falls, we benefit. Well, look, Mr. President, the price has fallen. But we are paying more for premium gasoline than it is being charged in the United States from research that I have been advised on. Again, I stand to be corrected. So the point that I wish to emphasize is that we need to pay attention to capping fuel prices at the pump. It is the government that closed down Petrotrend. And because of the closure of Petrotrend, we are experiencing these challenges. And we must never forget before Petrotrend was closed, the government decided to amend the Petroleum Levy and Subsidy Act from allowing the multinational corporations to pay the subsidies so that prices can remain low for the consumer. And I think they impose a 2% on gross revenues emanating from these oil corporations and energy companies. And the government took the decision to make up the difference. So here we are today where because of this decision and the closure of Petrotrend, we are now subject to the market forces as a result of those actions. We are calling on the government to take action to prevent any further increases at the pump. The government said they were going to liberalize. 
the market. It is almost two years now, and we are waiting the liberalization of the market. The government also said they were going to sell NP gas stations. We are still awaiting the sale of NP gas stations. Now, it is not to say that we are in support of these things, but the government said that was their policy. So, Mr. President, I raise this matter of calling on the government to put a cap on fuel prices because we know when the price of oil goes down, when the price of gas goes down, then there are implications for revenues. And when there are implications for revenues, somebody has to pay the price. And sometimes it ends up being the consumers through higher gasoline prices as an example. So, Mr. President, I would like the government to share with Trinidad and Tobago how it intends to deal with what is taking place at the international global energy market, the constant fall in the average price of a barrel of oil, the, 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 the challenges that we are now seeing occurring on the gas market, and whether the government is going to use those developments. Senator, you have two more minutes. Whether the government will use those developments to further punish the population. And therefore, I call on the government to place a cap, or consider, I should say, placing a cap on any further increases in fuel prices at the pump. And if the government wishes to implement its policy as it relates to liberalizing and deregulating the fuel market through the price mechanism apparatus, so when the price of crude oil rises, the population pay higher prices. When the price falls, they are supposed to benefit. Let the government make up its mind as to what it wants to do rather than have the population being in a state of inbetweenity and uncertainty as it relates to future price prices at the level of the pump in Trinidad and Tobago. So I look forward to the government clearing the air on this matter and providing some assurances to the population on the way forward as it relates to fuel prices that can, in fact, result in a um, um, dislocation in our nation. And the people are saying clearly they cannot carry any further burdens at the pump. We need the government to pay attention to the cries of the population. I thank you, Mr. Mayor. Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, it is said a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. But I'm not sure what is the corollary when there's an absence of knowledge. Maybe very dangerous. So I want to put on record for the benefit of Senator Mark and his colleagues. Our local crude is a mixture of what is called Molo crude, produced by Heritage Petroleum, and other crudes, primarily light Swede, sweet crude oil, produced off the east coast of Trinidad. And when one looks at the prices that our crude, the weighted average prices of our crude, because you have to look at 
production. You can't look at prices in a vacuum. You also have to look at production. So when you look at the oil produced, for example, in the fields that used to be owned by BP, now being managed by other oil companies, and one looks at the price that Heritage is getting for its crude, the figures I have seen, and, the figure, and this has been made well known on numerous occasions, since there was a fallacy propagated by the opposition that we would be unable as a country to sell our crude oil because nobody would want it. Now, that is so far from the truth is not funny. The price we are getting for our oil is very close to Brent price, not West Texas Intermediate. So when you are looking at the price of oil, I would ask Senator Mark, please do not just look at WTI, which is the US benchmark, which is usually the price that is quoted for the uninformed. Take a look at the price of Brent crude oil. We are just about a dollar below that, dollar fifty and so on. And in August of 2022, August 29th, the price of Brent was $99.55. That price then dropped by September 26, 2022, budget day, to $86.37. Very shortly thereafter, by October the 7th, just Two weeks later, price was $95.98. So it dropped from $100 down to $86, jumped back up to $96, just in a two-week period, dropped back down to $89 on October the 19th, back up on November the 4th to $96, and then declined to a price of $76 on December the 8th. Then, just three weeks later, went back up to 86 on December 29th, Drop back down to eighty dollars a few weeks later, and today it's eighty six dollars and thirty six cents. So there's extreme volatility in the oil pricing market, and it stands to reason. There are all sorts of factors that are being brought to bear on the price of oil at this point in time. Of course, you have the extended war in Ukraine. It was thought that that war would be over in a month. At least Putin thought so. But he was wrong. The war has now been going on for almost a year. And the price of oil has remained elevated because of those tensions in that part of Europe. But you also have issues with demand. Because China went through a series of lockdowns which affected economic activity in China, which affected demand for Chinese goods, which affected Chinese demand for raw materials because China is not a large producer of oil. So it has to import oil and natural gas. So that because of the uncertainties of China's approach to COVID and the fact that they were locking down major cities, Shanghai and various other of their major cities and shutting everything down, the demand for oil went down, the price went down. As China started to ease its COVID policy and started to open up again, demand for oil goes back up, price goes back up. So the point I am making, over the last three to four months, We've seen oil go from $100 down to $76, 
up to $85, down to $80, and back up to $86 today. Who knows where it will be tomorrow? In fact, it has jumped from $76 just two weeks ago to $86 today. So we in the government have to take a measured view. You can't just jump. We have to monitor the oil price before we make any move at all. With respect to natural gas, I'd like to educate Senator Gas, Senator Mark. That might have been a Freudian slip. <laughs> a Freudian slip. <laughs> Senator Gas. But Senator Mark, I'd like to educate the Honorable Senator Wade Mark. There is no component of natural gas that is used to produce gasoline. Gasoline is produced from oil. And therefore, the price of natural gas is wholly irrelevant when one is looking at the price of gasoline and a fuel subsidy. Wholly irrelevant. There's not one constituent element of natural gas that is used to make gasoline. And therefore, natural gas prices should not come into any discourse on this. I simply want to say, in response to the point made by Senator Mark, that there is no plan at this point in time for further increases in the price of fuel. Honorable Senators, the question is that this Senate do now adjourn to Tuesday, January 31st, 2023 at 1.30 p.m. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. This Senate now stands adjourned to Tuesday, January 31st, 2023 at 1.30 p.m.